o'clock. So I call the City of University Heights City Council meeting to order. Today it's Tuesday, June 9th, 2020, and the meeting is being conducted electronically. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, setting up the link and sending it to everyone. And I see some public have joined too. Thank you very much. Um, uh, five council are present. And so the first order of business is approval of minutes from May 12th, regular council meeting, May 19th, special council meeting, and June 2nd, work session. Uh, Chris sent them out at different times. Is there any additions or corrections to any of the three? Hearing none, all three minutes are approved by unanimous consent. Louise, can I just ask, if, if that music is disturbing anybody else? I think it is. Okay, let me have Kate turn it down a little bit. What he was saying was he thought it was a movie that Kate was watching. <clears throat> and so I'll wait a second while he comes back. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. I wanted to start our meeting tonight by addressing the tragic killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the resulting protests nationally and locally. I am proud of our residents and their participation in protesting against racism and calling for change. I am also proud of Chief Troy Kelsey and the University Heights Police Department for fostering an environment of open communication and dialogue and protecting the rights of everyone, those protesting and those not protesting. Local protesters marched through University Heights Saturday night without significant incident aside from graffiti on streets and some city and private signs. UHPD was present and protected the rights of those marching and the rights of those not marching. UHPD has worked with neighboring departments through the protests to coordinate the protection for everyone involved and will continue to do so. I also wanted to point out that the City of University Heights and UHPD have already worked to address some of the issues. Nearly two years ago, the City Council and UHPD began working with local NCAA leaders and others to come up with local regulations to combat racism. As a result, the University Heights City Council unanimously adopted an ordinance more than a year ago to establish standards and expectations for UHPD relations with our community. The city was recognized as being the first in Iowa to enact such an ordinance. Through the ordinance, the city and UHPD partner with local NAACP leaders who were involved in identifying issues and specific provisions to be included in the ordinance. The ordinance takes the following steps to help promote police community relations. It prohibits profiling, discriminatory policing, and disparate treatment in the course of performing law enforcement duties on the basis of a person's race, color, ethnicity, religion, or national origin. It creates a citizen's advisory board to review allegations of profiling, discriminatory policing practices, and disparate treatment while performing law enforcement duties. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has interrupted the citizen advisory board's work but we look forward to the board's important contribution to our community. The ordinance requires UHPD to collect data with regard to community interactions and report that data to the city council and make the da data available online. It also mandates UHPD chief and officers receive training related to the prohibition against profiling and disparate treatment, including implicit bias training, and data collection and reporting. As a community and a city, 
we will continue to listen and take action to combat racism in all its forms. I'm gonna include this so that it can be put on the city website with the meeting. I'd, I'd like Troy Kelsey, Chief Kelsey now to give an update on what the UHPD has been working with the community and with the city. Hi, Troy. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, that, I touched on this as part of my report, but I will go to it now. Uh, first of all, I am fortunate to be working and associated with University Heights. Uh, everybody from the community members who were out both the night that the march came through town and were along the streets uh, peacefully and in support of some of the messages that the protesters had to say. And I, and I am aware that many of those same community members were out the following morning uh, trying to clean up University Heights uh, and, and address some of, the, some of the mischief that had been done by the marchers. Uh, so I think that it's a great community. I think the council has, as the mayor already touched on, been very progressive in this both and a lot of the credit goes to well Lisa was on the previous council but the the prior council and the work that they did uh, and our partnership with the NAACP I've been in daily conversations with Kevin Sanders the president of the Iowa City chapter uh, about how to best address this and how to move forward after after it kind of winds down uh, at least the, the non-productive perhaps for my officers, again, I want to throw out a big thank you to them. They have, when I've asked them to be here, when I've done an all call, if you will, and said, I'm not sure that other agencies will be able to support us, and we're kind of out here on our own. Uh, the other agencies have promised to support us if they're able, but they're also dealing with some of the fallout. They've been here. They've shown a maturity. They have not escalated the situations by their actions or their words. And when the marchers came through, uh, when the demonstrators came through, they were able to give voice to their outrage. And frankly, they should be outraged uh, without it turning into a local confrontation. And so anyway, I, I think University Heights is unique in that. Uh, I have uh, in daily conversations with the other chiefs in our debriefing of what happened the night before and what we expect to happen this evening. Uh, we are the only municipality, at least the only police department that has received absolutely no negative comments about the way that we have handled or interacted with people trying to express their anger and outrage and call for protest. Everything that has come in to, to me or has been relayed to me has been in positive. It's been in support of, of some of the voices in the community, don't get me wrong, but it's also been support of the police department and our interaction and our efforts. So that's a big thing. As far as where we are right now, uh, tonight is a night off, if you will, for the protesters. The Iowa City Council meets today at 2.30. Uh, the, the leaders, if you will, of the organization that is, is kind of driving some of these marches has, has asked their supporters and, and people from both the community and elsewhere who are coming in to, to step back and catch their breath tonight and tomorrow and to give specifically the Iowa City Police Department, but local governments and local law enforcement agencies a chance to, to assess and respond to, to their demands and, and to their asks. And that is exactly what governments and law enforcement agencies are doing right now. So I don't expect there to be very much happening tonight. The weather will probably play into that, but we are, I believe we're at a turning point now where maybe there will be less noise and more conversation and, and more meaningful dialogue resulting in meaningful change. Uh, just some quick updates on steps that the police department took. Yes, we supported other agencies, whether that was calls for service or, or in defense of property. Uh, steps that we took locally, I contacted the Tipton police chief. Uh, as you're all aware, Tipton's in the process of buying our 2017 Ford Explorer. I had not yet received the title, so we could not finalize those arrangements. I had conversations with the Tipton chief and said, Lisa, you are as able to store that Explorer as I am here, and I would hate to see it damaged because it's a target of opportunity for somebody who is, who, who is acting out of raw emotion. 
and the Tipton Police Department did come and collect that vehicle and it is being stored in their garage right now and they've begun on the conversion. Uh, they did leave a check for me, but until I can exchange paperwork th with them and hand the title to them, I have not passed that along to Chris yet. Uh, the police department itself, we tried to make it as low visibility as possible. Certainly the marchers and the organizers knew where City Hall was and knew where the police department was. Uh, but for example, the vinyl lettering, the white vinyl lettering on the exterior of the Melrose uh, facing door, we removed that just again to prevent to to eliminate any anything that might be a flashpoint we were visible we were visible on the street out front our cars had their lights on i was standing on the sidewalks and frankly we allowed ourselves to be vented at by by those who who saw the need for that uh, i also contacted one university place uh, terry and they were very very helpful uh, they arranged for us to have some very temporary parking in the underground parking at the North Tower so that again, we could remove potential temptations and potential targets and hopefully limit the damage, both the city property, but also to people who then might damage, further damage one university place or the property of those who live there. So th those, are, those are some of the steps that we took that night. And again, we worked closely with the other law enforcement agencies, much like the COVID response. This has been a joint response. We are each governed and limited by our own uh, political entities, but we've been able, I think as a community, especially in University Heights, to have a largely successful response. If okay, I didn't answer any questions, I can share some, some footage of the uh, actual march for those not now, but at another time. If, it's, if your questions are about specific tactics, I'm not comfortable talking about that in this forum because I don't do something that potentially compromises everybody's uh, efforts to try to keep the community, the protesters safe. There were counter protesters. Uh, there has been credible, credible information that, that some of those protesters were ready for there to be violence and some of the counter protesters were ready for that. And again, we're trying to diffuse the situation, allow everybody to have a voice. So I don't want to share any information or tactics that might compromise that effort. Uh Thank you, Troy. Uh, any questions, we'll just uh, go with the police report too, okay, later on. Okay. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, public input. Would anyone from the public speak? Uh, we have five minutes that you can speak and address the council. Um, let Sarah know if you want to speak. I submitted um, a comment to Chris Anderson, but so I don't know what order you're taking. Uh, when did you submit that, oh, Sylvia? Via email? I haven't checked email since work, so I haven't seen it. Well, okay, so I'm in line. You're first in line, Sylvia. Okay, thank you. Are you gonna speak, am I supposed to look it up? No, I'm here. I'm just waiting for you guys to tell me when to start. Okay, you can go ahead and start. Thank you, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the death of George Floyd demands justice from many sections in American life, in its particular or law enforcement uh, paradigm. And I'm happy that as a nation, we are undergoing a discussion on that and an evaluation. But locally, let's start by asking the question about justice, what this council has been doing or should be doing to roll out Ordinance 235. Ordinance 235 had some deadlines and some technical requirements. They're written in plain English, very easy to understand. And now that the city PD has new computers, new cars, new network, I would want to know where exactly are we on implementing the data collection that's required in Ordinance 235. It's more than six months since it should have been rolled out and implemented. It was funded by the last council. And I'd like to hear from the counselors at a later time or now where they stand on implementing the technical aspects that make Ordinance 235 work. 
I understand from the chief's reports and prior council meetings that meetings are postponed and delayed as a result of COVID. However, municipal work throughout the state of Iowa continues to happen through Zoom, go to meetings and any other technology options. And I would like for this council to direct our P chief of police to work within those paradigms of alternative working spaces to make Ordinance 235 happen because the community, uh, the Citizens Review Board is not fully functioning at this point. You've appointed members of the public, but they haven't come up with any rules. They haven't articulated any policies, none of that. There's more work to be done. And finally, the history of Ordinance 235 is distorted and shortchanged by the message that the mayor provided. It's a disservice in this time of grief and in this time of societal discussion when we need to take very careful consideration of what is being said and what is not being said. Ordinance 235 came about because a woman of color, a Latina on city council, had access to litigation confidential information that discussed the operations of a police department. That information was disturbing and had significant ramifications of left unaddressed. And I decided that I could not sleep unless I took action, and I did. So I worked very hard to understand, engage where the council was, and to get the information that became the basis for Ordinance 235. And it was myself who requested that the National Association, that the NAACP, Iowa, Nebraska chapter, the ACLU, LULAC, and Iowa CCI come and assist this council with a small staff who does not understand racial disparities in police enforcement or the data that we had on hand to help us sort through what would make sense for our small, tiny community. It wasn't because we reached out and thought it would be nice to have, it was needed. And it was a very long and difficult road to get Ordinance 235 passed and discussed. There was stalling, stonewalling, and resistance from all sides but I'm at the end, we all came together and coalesced on the fundamental principle that University Heights could do better. And because we could do better, we did so. And in December, we enacted the third reading of Ordinance 235, which has had significant, significant changes to our police enforcement policies. And it's enabled our police department to have better assistance from technology to do their work. As far as I'm concerned, we have made and raised the level of servicing police enforcement services to a higher level, and we've given them every means and every tool that they need in order to carry out their job in a more professional way that does not give any implication or any rise to race, orientation, gender, religious beliefs or any protected classes. You need to start Focus policing. You need to start closing. So for me to hear from the mayor tonight that that is the um, story she understood. It's quite a short story, but that's ordinance 235. And I asked the question in closing, will this council continue with a super conservative explanation and shielding of public records from public view simply because they are tucked away in the file of an employee when it has nothing to do with that employee's performance. And all it has to do with is the description of an operation of a department. So thank those are the two questions I'd like to have some discussion for you all tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, would anyone else like to address the council tonight? Okay, we'll go um, on. I, I believe Laura Westmeyer would like to speak if she can oh. be muted. Yeah, I can, I can unmute you, Laura. Who, who, okay. did, who, does, who wants you. to speak? 
So my name is Laura Westmeyer, and I, uh, we own a couple of houses in University Heights that we lease to uh, tenants. And I wanted to just share just a little perspective. Um, I've wanted to go to the meetings for the past year and just haven't really been able to like make it. And when I found out they were on Zoom, um, Doug Swales is a friend of ours. Um, it just made it very simple for me to come tonight or to uh, address you guys tonight. So um, we have, uh, I would consider my husband and I extremely good landlords. Um, and I want to just share a little history with our house. We bought it in 2016. Our first house is on Lemur Court. Wonderful couple, Hope and Jeff Garbett moved in. He is an assistant uh, rowing coach at the university. She's a teacher. Um, they, Jeff said, Laura, we never had any plans of moving. They lived there for three and a half, four years, and honestly just got tired of feeling like they were not uh, like human beings because of the way they were treated as tenants. And they're amazing and great <coughs> people and three different situations that I want to share with you that really were upsetting to them. Um, you know, one of the things we had to do was fill out the tenant lease and I had to ask them their age and they were truly offended. Like, why do you need to know my age? Um, second thing, they went on vacation for a couple of weeks, came back, their grass was a little too high, never had it happened. Two warnings very quickly. And that was, you know, they're, they're, they were very conscientious and cared a lot about the community. So, uh, then we had the porta potty that we had to cover with the shower curtain. And, and then of course that was like disbanded shortly thereafter, but they didn't feel like, for me, I love having adult couples. I love having families. And for me, I was like, you know, if you want me to get a bunch of college kids living in here, that's going to be easier because my college kids are happy to share their age. They're happy to be told to cut the grass. But when you truly have responsible tenants in there that have owned homes, so Hope and Jeff moved after saying, we don't think we, you know, we didn't think we'd ever move, but they just bought a house in Coralville. So then I had, I moved in Kelly and Heidi Weston. Heidi had a beautiful green thumb. Our yard is or was the most beautiful yard on Lamer Court when Heidi lived there. They were moving in. The day they're moving in, they've got their, their rental truck, you know, their U-Haul. It's obvious they're moving in. Their son is a student at the University of Iowa. His buddy dropped him off. Um, his buddy wanted to come in and see the house. Wasn't there any more than five minutes, and Kelly said the police were there to tell him to change his, where his car was parked, because it was parked on the wrong side, and Kelly and Heidi knew that. They are both, Heidi grew up in the community. Um, they knew it was on the wrong side, but they're like, it was there for five minutes. Our rental truck was like right in front of the yard. And so just no common sense was given to them. Um, and so I, I want to really, first of all, I want to say thank you so much to the new chief of police. I really do feel like that's a step in the right direction. He's so warm and welcoming. And I really, uh, I think that there would be some common sense. You see a rental truck, um, you know, they're new to the neighborhood. You know, Kelly said, boy, that's a great way to warm us into the neighborhood. The cops showing up immediately telling us to move our cars. So what, what I have always tried to do is have responsible and caring tenants live in our homes because we truly have our homes. I don't want to fill it with college kids. And I do know that there are some very bad landlords as well in the community. And I think we've got to apply a little more common sense. I think the lease, you know, the lease applications need to be, you know, the, the simple, a, a simple lease application would be great. Uh, don't ask, don't, you know, don't, let's not get too involved. And then let's truly address those major issues that do come up with noise pollution and parties and late hours and trash. Truly address those real issues with those real tenants that are creating those problems and with those landlords that are not adhering to the rules. But I don't think we necessarily need more rules. I think we just need, you know, those few things that truly do impact the community. Um, and when the grass is high, absolutely. But if somebody's cut their grass consistently for three years and for a week it gets high, you know, let's apply common sense. Um, because if we treat adults as if they are 18 year olds, um, then we're going to lose the adults and I'm going to only be able to find 18 year olds that want to live in University Heights. And that's not what I would like to do with my home. Um, so just keep that in mind as you guys move forward and, um, and know that there truly are good landlords that do want to be good landlords and are happy to have feedback and happy to, to do anything we can to help us. Really quick. You need to start closing quick. Okay, and I'm, and I'm done, I'm done. So 
So just thank you guys. I mean, truly, it's been a, a pretty good experience. But I also want to say just let's just be succinct about it. Don't make me jump through too many hoops. I don't have somebody I pay 12 bucks an hour to fill out my applications. I do it all myself. And the, the, the bad landlords probably just hire a management company and they've never seen the house they own or they go there once every, you know, three years. I was there today bailing out water in my basement. So, so don't, you know, don't, I, I'd like to stay a landlord in University Heights. Keep me there and be grateful in a sense for those of us that, that do care. So that's, I guess that's kind of my whole message. And thank you to the new chief. Thank you, Laura. Uh, would anyone else Thank like you. to speak to the council tonight? I don't want to speak too soon. Last time I did. So uh, one last call. Does anyone want to speak to the council? Okay, we're going to move on to mayor's report. And quickly, <laughs> I want to give a um, Farmer's Market update. Um, <clears throat> good news about the Farmer's Market. David Keft of UI um, talked to uh, the people that were using that parking lot. And, if, and he just told me a few weeks ago that the city can now use the former University Club parking lot for a Farmer's Market after all. And I've been working with Chief Kelsey about observing Coralville's market. We both have observed it. We plan to implement similar COVID-19 safety measures for vendors and patrons. And it will be a walk through market. The first market starts next Tuesday, June 16th from four to six. And during this time of the pandemic, there will be no charge for the vendors to join our market as it <clears throat> opportunity for them to sell their goods and also makes goods available to the all the neighborhoods in the area so look hope everyone comes to the market next tuesday from four to six and uh so is uh, the next business is jim glasgow jim are you here tonight yeah there he is yeah i'm here um hey, jim so Sarah's got some photos from uh, just a few days ago on the hotel. Uh, I just like, I guess I, I want to start out by thanking uh, uh, Josiah and Steve Ballard and especially Doug Swales. We we're kind of on graffiti detail Sunday and uh, they, they hit our sign pretty good and, and uh, some of the signs down Melrose. So I, I've got, I think, a couple pictures of that too. Yeah, actually, yeah, right here. <laughs> oh, she's getting your pictures up. I yeah, see. right. Yeah. Can you see my, can you see the picture? No. I, yeah, it's not yet. Oh, okay. Oh, you want me to, well, you, you want no, me to I click? No, I can do it. I just, I think I was sharing the wrong thing. I'll just share it all. Okay. 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 There's, this is from Sunday. Uh, I was there with uh, uh, Josiah and Steve Ballard. We're, we're cleaning off our, our sign for the hotel. And then uh, Doug happened by and, and luckily he did because he's got the, got the method down for really cleaning graffiti. It was a brake cleaner and sprayed some of that on the, on the uh, graffiti and it just, it came right off. Uh, so Actually, after we got done cleaning the signs kind of out in front of the hotel, I went down by Kinnick Stadium. And there was one uh, road sign there that hadn't been cleaned and and uh, used the brake cleaner on that, and it, it worked pretty well. The only thing I found is that some of the signs, it does take off the underlying lettering if it's... If it's uh, I did too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so anyway, you got to be careful. You got to give it a little test, but yep. but in general, it worked real well. And uh, then we found out that Orange Cleaner was another pretty good product. And anything with a citrus, a citrus cleaner works pretty well. And I, I had been talking to some of the guys from the DOT, and they said that um, a lot of their signs they were just replacing. So I, I don't know how expensive expensive that is, but I think possibly uh, 
when when we think the, the graffiti is over, we can go down Melrose and and see which ones we can clean up because uh, it won't take too long with this stuff. So, but anyway, I'd like to I'd like to thank the police too. They they kept everybody out of the, they, they kept them there at the hotel driveway and kind of shoot them on down down the line, which uh, really helped because they could have done a lot of damage there in the hotel. So, um, yeah, we can go on to a different picture then. There's one more, Doug. Yeah. Oh, there's okay. Well, that's where Doug started. And I'm not, literally within a minute. He was he was to the other picture where, where it was clean. So, uh, like I say, that 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 worked pretty well. So, now you're going to start to see you're going to start to see a transition in the hotel from blue to yellow, and. Uh, what what you have been seeing here, if it, if any of you have been on site, it this this exterior uh, blue material is is kind of a rubberized vinyl, and that's actually what completely water seals the building. And now we're putting on an inch of styrofoam on top of that, and then on, on top of the styrofoam will be a, a metal substructure which will hold the brick or the stone or wood or wood whatever we're going to use for the exterior. So well, the building right now is, is sealed up. Uh, the roof is on. We're missing missing a couple big patio windows up in the upper restaurant, but uh, right now we're we're getting ready to to start some of the exterior brick and stone. So you're going to see you're going to see a fairly big change here in the next few weeks. So this view this is this view is from the railroad track side, and. Uh, if you so up at the very top, you're looking at the uh, restaurant. That that's the main part of the restaurant where the main seating is, where those big windows are up on top. Down below, where that uh, one projection, there's a, a roof a roof down below which covers our outside seating, and then there's quite a bit of outside seating that wraps around that even. And where the uh, where the boom boom lift is sitting is actually outside seating, and it goes con continues all along the those glass windows. Uh, along the lower level restaurant, and you can kind of see that they're we're, we're starting that yellow styrofoam all along all along this side. We'll probably be bricking or or putting stone on this side first, the way it's going. So, this is a this is a view, kind of from the back side of the building, again looking at the the upper level restaurant and the uh, lower level restaurant. And and the outside seating down there at the lower level, um, it, it comes past that rectangular uh, wood structure. That's actually an entrance from the railroad track side. It goes, it'll go directly into the restaurant lobby area. So now you're looking at the Melrose side and you can see we've got quite a bit of the of the foam already installed on this side. So this is this will be the side that really we're, we're going to be starting the exterior uh, first in this area. Uh oh, I must have doubled. I'm going to do the same here. Now, now you're looking. Uh, you're on sixth floor there, or the or the uh, the rooftop. And you're looking at Children's Hospital. This is the view that you have from the restaurant uh, on on the on the roof, and you can see Kinnick Stadium. The, we can actually see a little bit down into the bleachers. I mean, you can't see the field, but you see the real big TV over there. And uh, the view from that that uh, room is is just spectacular. I mean, it's 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 a panoramic view of the whole university, and clear over into Iowa City in the courthouse in downtown Iowa City. So we're, now we're getting ready to, you can move on to the next picture and I'll, I'll show you. Uh, we've, been, we've been spraying the, the ceiling. So the material that you see sprayed on these uh, web trusses is a, is a fireproofing material. And that's Peter Harmon in the yellow hard hat with his, one of his designers and you can see that we've got pipes already stubbed up through the floor. Uh, they're actually standing in what's going to be a, a kind of a U-shaped bar area. 
So you can go on to the next one. That's what, um, this is the main, this is the main uh, restaurant seating area. So it's, again, it's fireproof. When we get all done, there's gonna be ductwork hanging hang below this uh, fireproofed area. And it's gonna, it's, it's kind of that industrial look where you're, you're gonna be looking up at the open web trusses. So these trusses now will be sealed up with a clear sealer and then uh, probably be painted black or some dark color. And then, and then all the ductwork and a lot of the mechanical will hang below that. I don't know if that was the last one. I think it was, yeah, the last one. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's where we are right now. Uh, we're, we're really doing quite a bit of uh, design work on both the upper restaurant and the lower restaurant. And uh, the water service now is completed. Uh, we've got water into the into the building, and I'm hoping is if I can get along with Iowa City long enough, we'll turn the, we'll turn the water on next week, and have the whole building pressurized. Um, let's see. I guess uh, other than that, uh, like I say, the the exterior is really going to be the next big change, but. Um, and everything is, is going fine. We don't have any material problems. We don't have any workers not showing up. Uh, everybody's staying pretty healthy and, and uh, the job's going along real well, so. Any questions for Jim? Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you, Jim, for joining us tonight. Appreciate yeah, and, and again, thanks. Special thanks to Doug. I mean, he, he saved me a lot of time. I was scrubbing for about an hour before he showed up, and then we finished the whole thing in about five minutes. So, okay, all right, I'll, I'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Thank Jim. You. Yep. Okay, uh, we'll go on to the uh, legal report. Uh, Steve, you submitted a legal report. Do you want to give a little introduction? I'll be happy to. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Uh, yeah, so I, it kind of just kept going. I suppose you noticed that too. Um, but the first, the, the first issue on the agenda, and I guess it's the first item in the report, is the proposed Finkbine uh, redevelopment. Uh, the council had its uh, special meeting and discussed uh, issues and uh, you know, had information. And I think uh, the opportunity to submit other questions or ask about additional things and as far as I know, most of those things have been answered. If there's anything outstanding for me, um, uh, uh, please ask. Uh, by the same token, uh, Kent Ralston is with us this evening, as well as David Keft from the uh, university uh, and uh, Nate Kading and Ben Logsdon uh, from the development team. So um, I guess I won't belabor the the, okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, why don't we go to Ben and Nate and David to kind of review some of the questions or comments they want to make before we go to Kent. Sure. Uh, thank you, Louise, for um, the last few months and thanks all council for uh, working with us to get to this point tonight. <clears throat> Louise, I had a chance to catch up with Louise this morning and she asked us to kind of consolidate some of the questions and key elements um, into just some quick answers just as a review for everyone prior to diving in. So we, uh, Ben and David and I have kind of put, put some of these key points together and we have about five or six questions that we can kind of touch on quickly here. Um, the first one is, you know, the project timeline and what is the project? Just as a reminder, we're hoping to get started with construction in the spring of 2021. And the issue before everyone right now is the potential change of the municipal jurisdiction line, either uh, so the project lands in Iowa City or University Heights. So our hope is tonight that we have some direction from University Heights on, on the preference there, which would then trigger the, the different city staffs and the university and us as a development group to begin the process of putting together a 28 e agreement um, and working towards uh, an agreement that everyone um, is happy with and, and then we can get started on the project at that time. As a reminder, the, uh, the project itself is uh, what we're calling a 55 plus active adult um, apartment community. Um, this will have amenities that are geared towards that kind of 55 to 70 year old um, age set. Uh, it's a lot of synergies between the Finkbine golf course and the community there and the university and 
um, some amenities that will be uh, really um, appealing to folks of that of that particular age group. And uh, it's with a we're partnering with a development ownership group out of uh, Des Moines, Newberry Living, uh, who's done a lot of proven concepts around the state of Iowa. And uh, we're really excited about the about the potential and the prospects here. Um, David, I didn't know if you wanted or Ben to speak a bit about one of the questions that we've also got is around design standards of the building, what the building will look like. All of council's been able to see see some photos, but uh, maybe David, if you wanted to speak a bit about the university's role and in, in you know the what the development will look like and the project itself. Yeah, so the university views it as an important gateway to to University Heights and to the university uh, and the hospital system, and so. The, the how we selected this development team was through a competitive RFP process. And as part of that, it was the, the architect team and, and the history of the development team. It's really important to the university. Um, some of the original concepts and renderings will hold the, the development team tight to those, those concept plans. And you know, we'll have oversight over this throughout the whole process. Um, we'll be entering into a, a long-term 40-year ground lease with the development team. And so that, though, that actually won't occur until all the design parameters are, are agreed to uh, between the university uh, and the developers. Uh, our senior vice president, Rod Leonard, who's also the university architect, has been very involved with this project, as well as folks on our athletics um, administration and really view it as something we, we want to be proud of uh, for the long haul and really view it as, a, as an asset to the community, asset to the, to the, to the university and to the um, UIHC. Um, in addition, the, the, however the jurisdictional boundaries are going to move, um, that building and, and uh, planning group will have input into the, uh, into the, um, uh, the design and look and then you know, however, the 28 E agreement is drafted gives gives sort of the, you know, depending on how it's drafted, can give you know some input into uh, the 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 community that's not getting jurisdiction can then still have some involvement, uh, depending on the wording of the of the 28 E agreement. And so, uh, I think it's important for people to know that. You know, tonight is sort of setting that parameter of which jurisdiction it's going to. Then there has to be further development of that actual, the details of that 2080 agreement. And that would come back before council for approval before the mayor signed it. And so um, it, it, what, what's agreed to tonight is just sort of the roadmap of which direction we're going to, but it's, it's not as if, as if every detail needs to be thoroughly uh, worked out. That can happen within the framework of that, that 28 E agreement. That can be, uh, you know, a, an agreement that's, that's two paragraphs or, or, or 20 pages. It just depends on, you know, the, 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 how, the, the wishes of, of both councils, University Heights and Iowa City, depending on how all of this works out. So, but, but on the, the, the design standards, I'm real, we want this to be, something that's a uh, um, um, sort of a game changer and a, a great uh, gateway into the into the community you, you david also want to touch on i know one of the the things that we've spoken about is the the property adjacent to the uh, swisher track that the university of heights the city has planned for uh kind of a park trail system do you want to speak david a bit to how the university may approach that yeah, so I call it the triangle piece. It's sort of the shape of the, of the land there to the, to the north. It's not actually con, uh, contiguous to the development we're talking about. It's, it's further to the north at, at the northern end of that Swisher track. Um, I've had good conversations with, with, again, with Rod Leonard, with Joe Glotta, who's our campus planner and the master planning team and the university, uh, again, subject to border region approval but the university would strongly recommend to the Board of Regents the, uh, the conveyance of that property to, uh, to University Heights for, uh, for, for a trail system. It's, it's sort of, um, um, you know, untouched woodlands now and whether it's that way uh, in the university's name or, or University Heights name doesn't make much difference to us. And so we'd be, you know, happy to convey that to the um, to University Heights for part of their access to their, their trail or park or whatever is developed in, um, in that area. 
Could I have Kent Ralston now, who's the uh, executive director of the MPO? I invited him back because, as you remember, there was questions by some of the council about uh, how that land could be developed if there's some grant funding or anything through the MPO. Kent, could you, did you get some research done on that? Yeah, I did contact the Department of Transportation and the typical funding that the university has. Can everyone hear me okay, Mayor? No, we Mayor, can't. can you hear me? We go in and out and it's blurred. Yeah, I think you're yeah. on. Oh my goodness. I had this problem at our last meeting. Yeah. Kent, if you call, I will make sure you're unmuted. I think last time I missed I will call in to do the audio. I'll make sure you're unmuted. I missed your comment last meeting to unmute you. So you're gonna have him call in? Yeah. But if you remember last time he called in, um, but he had trouble getting off mute and he'd sent me a comment and I, I didn't see it till the end of the meeting. Louise, we have, a, we have a couple other key points we can get to that maybe come back to that. Thanks, Nate. Would that be okay? One of, uh, a couple other questions that have popped up um, around uh, the University Heights and a monument sign. David, Ben, do you want to touch on that component? Sure. We, um, and I, I'll start and David can, can add if he, he wants to, but on some of the earlier renderings, we, uh, we actually showed a University Heights uh, welcome to University Heights sign. Obviously, that's still to be uh, designed, and, and the look would be um, up to the folks in University Heights to kind of decide upon and, and get built. But we're certainly um, agreeable to um, allowing space on our site, whether it's via a separate plat or an easement, uh, signage easement um, for University Heights, whether it's in obviously in use in University Heights or in Iowa City. So I think that's something that uh, that we're, we're comfortable saying we, we would agree to uh, um, regardless of what community it ended up in. Yeah, I think it could be handled pretty quick, easily with a signage easement that would allow the city to construct and maintain a, you know, sort of a gateway welcome to University Heights or however you wanted to, whatever type of sign you wanted with plantings around it that's a um, uh, something that can can easily be accommodated and again would be part of the 2080 agreement. And then the, the last question something that Doug and I had spoken about a couple times over the last week is uh, you know with some of the history with the surface parking lot at the former athletic club site and then in the, the future development there's there there's some smaller surface parking lots and what the possibility and potential is for continuing some of the events that currently happen there, whether it's the farmer's market or some other events. And Doug and I just spoke about how, and have talked to the development team about how we think that'd be a, a really nice fit for the residents there. And, you know, part of the, the core mission and core attraction of living in this particular development, at least we hope is, you know, the, the continuity and the collaboration with uh, the university and university athletics and the communities around there and the folks of the target demographic here, you know, are inclined to really participate in those sort of things like a farmer's market. So we, we would really view that opportunity as a win-win and would look forward to discussing that more in depth when the time was right. Yeah, I think operationally it would just be something we need to figure out with, uh, with the operators of the, the development, but certainly like Nate said, I think that's a, that's something that um, I think would, uh, would be good for the community and, and uh, good for the uh, residents of, uh, of the development, so. Nate, and do you guys think that could be something that would happen either way, if it, depending on where they, the, the, the line moved, or is that something? Yeah, I think it would be, I think we would view it as an, an amenity, really, as long as operationally, obviously, the folks that uh, run the facility, there'd have to be some sort of, um, you know, agreement with the residents, uh, since you are taking some parking. Uh, and we obviously have to figure out how much, but I think there's certainly it'd be something that uh, would be a, uh, I think a win-win uh, um, 
for uh, yeah. the community and for the residents if we could figure out how to do that. So. Is Kent able to speak now or? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. There he is. Well, I'm clear. I apologize. I'm on a different computer and a different internet, but I'm having uh, trouble regardless. Uh, good evening, Kent Ralston. I'm the director of the MPO. As was mentioned previously, thanks for having me. Um, I did research the trail funding issue on the triangular piece of property that both David and, and Nate had mentioned. Uh, the MPO funding that University Heights typically accesses um, through the MPO and has, and has had some success is what's referred to as our Transportation Alternative Program Fund. And the DOT is telling me that if the state retains that property, uh, basically that those funds could not be used for the trail. However, if University Heights would take that property, uh, or if it's conveyed to University Heights, then they, of course, can apply uh, as they have in the past and, and have been successful. Um, that funding is, uh, our competitive grant application will be available this fall, uh, early winter. And the funding, however, is not actually available until about uh, fiscal year 25. So we're actually out a few years in our programming, uh, as is typical and as, as the mayor uh, is accustomed to. So again, it's a competitive grant application, but University of Iowa has been successful in the past and no reason to believe they couldn't be again. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you, Kent. That's good to know. And uh, David said that if the property was conveyed with approval from the Board of Regents, then it would be University Heights, and we could possibly uh, get funding through this TAP program. Correct, that's my understanding, yes. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Kent? L Louise, it's, it's David. One other thing we've done, uh, another way we've done it before, and we did this with the city of Coralville along the Clear Creek is, we've given up a perpetual conservation easement, which is one of the few easements that's allowed to be sort of perpetual, it just goes um, forever. Um, I don't know if that's another option, and that way it, it, all, it protects it against you know, future development, but I don't know from Kent's perspective if, uh, if that's maybe not good enough, uh, that it needs to be an actual outright conveyance. Yeah, my understanding is it would have to be conveyed and actually under full city control, David. But uh, having said that, the DOT does have some flexibility. So that's just something we'd have to work through uh, okay. when the time came. Okay. Um, I have a question uh, for, for you, David. Does, does the university have, um, I mean, the ground from, between the Swisher track and the trail along, I think it's Finkbine Road, it's right along the golf course there. Do you have plans for that uh, particular area? Or is it developable? Does it fit in the same profile as that triangle? Uh, along the, the east side of that road, just going north, it, it, it drops off pretty, pretty rapidly, I think, into, into a ravine. Um, yeah. I don't know that, that it's, it's developable. Um, and we certainly don't have any plans for it. Um, okay, it would cost because it, it seems to me the real the real uh, sort of juice in this arrangement it would be if our trail connected to that trail and that in turn connected to the Clear Creek Trail, which would be uh, you know if, if I'm looking at grants from the DOT, that transportation and connection is is kind of critical. I think so. I, I just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah, I know yeah, there was, there was uh, talk at one point when um, the, the um, uh, university place, the Maxwell development was, uh, was in a, sort of in a concept stage even that um, um, they were interested in maybe putting some trails connecting in the back there uh, along behind where the university club is, Burkdale, and, and, and bringing that along so, so the residents there could have sort of golf cart path access access to the golf course uh, uh but i think it became the train just became too too difficult to too expensive to try to deal with fair enough are there any more questions uh steve you had given in your report 
uh, I think you could go through some of the explanation of the process of this being a part of the process, the council mm -hmm. voting tonight, whether it go east or west. Uh, Beth, Beth, thank you. Could you review some of that for the public? You bet. I'm happy to, uh, and I'm also happy to answer any questions. I know that for lots of the people in attendance tonight, this is uh, at least the second or third time you've heard things like this. But, but as as we said, this is the beginning. Even though we've, even though it probably doesn't feel like the beginning, because we've <laughs> talked about it quite a bit. But this uh, the vote. If the council takes a vote tonight, would be sort of the beginning of the formal process. Uh, the way I suggested that the council might want to. Uh, phrase a motion was just to direct city staff to sort of move in a direction of altering the boundary one way or the other or not. I mean, it's, it's the council's prerogative. You don't have to move it, but uh, to try to just, you know, express a preference and, and then, then we get to work on the detail. There's a, there's a, a specific process for severing property and, and annexing property. Um, you know, one, one municipality, one city to the other. Uh, there's a state review board. Um, so there'll be a series of agenda items, uh, public hearings, and additional votes that the council would, uh, would be undertaking as a part of moving the boundary. And then as David Kep mentioned, and, and as others have talked about tonight and at other meetings, that there, would, there would almost certainly be a 2080 agreement that would address uh, such things as revenue sharing, um, you know, perhaps the the monument ent entry sign, um, maybe use of the of the uh, common areas of the of the development, uh, different things that would uh, would be part of this 2080 agreement, and, and that would be, you know, some some time and some votes down the road. So. My point is, is that this is tonight's consideration and the council's uh, preference uh, expressed in a motion is, you know, is very much the beginning of uh, the formal process of, of taking the steps to annex and sever uh, property if the boundary is going to be moved. And um, the one part of that process that's made much easier here than it would be if, um, you know, if, if the former uh, university club property was individual lots owned by different people is with the university owning uh, being the only property owner um, that's one of the, one of the components of moving the moving the boundary line you have to get all the owners to agree well that that's just the university and so the university's agreeable and kind of wanting to get going here so I only mention that because there is a process and this would be the first step toward uh, authorizing and directing staff to move toward uh, the mechanism of moving the, pro the boundary one direction or the other. Are there any questions for Steve or anyone? I guess Steve, process wise, you know, we, we, you know, give a direction tonight and then if for whatever reason, like with this 28E agreement, we just can't agree. I mean, is it, is this something we're making some assumptions that this 28 agreement will have if those don't come to fruition you know at that point is there an option to reevaluate our decision yeah that's a good question sarah and there is i mean in my mind um as as with any uh, vote or uh, commitment um you know whether my clients the city council or the city of university heights or or an individual i mean you know, concepts of good faith and fair dealing certainly come into play. And, and I don't need to lecture you or the rest of the council or anyone else on that. But I, I say that uh, sincerely. Um, I, I think everyone uh, involved, uh, the, you know, the council here, the development team, the university, and then the city of Iowa City, which isn't present here, but everyone involved here, is, is anxious to know how the council, uh, the city council of University Heights, uh, thinks or feels about moving this boundary. But as I've said, there are going to be other steps. And so I don't, I'm not going to say that if the council votes to move it one way, and then the detail of that uh, decision just looks unworkable for this council. I don't mean to say that you can't go back, but, um, but I, I think that, um, I think that there's a certain amount of good faith and, uh, 
fair dealing that would come into play. And I, my sense is that everyone's wanting to cooperate and uh, work out a, a fair agreement for everybody. Uh, but I think it's a fair question. And, and so that's my answer is that no, if, if the council votes tonight one way or another, that's not carved in stone. And for example, with the boundary, it, it's just the other side of the coin of what I said about a lot of other votes to come. Uh, the council's not tonight voting to formally move the boundary. That, that would come later uh, regardless. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you, Steve. Would any other the council like to uh, say anything? Would you like to make, would anyone like to make a motion or? I'll make a motion. And that's you, Bobby? Yeah, yeah that was me, yeah. And you're making a motion to move the direction? To? Uh, motion directing mayor and city staff to work towards process of moving corporate boundary and drafting necessary documents and agreements uh, for presentation to and consider it. Oh, okay. So are you suggesting moving it east or west? I'm suggesting moving it east. Moving the current boundary east. So that the project would all be in Iowa City, right, Bobby? That is correct. Okay, that's a motion by Bobby. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Second by Casey. Uh, discussion. <clears throat> I know, like, one thing that we, we've talked about but not tonight is, you know, also the, the property tax benefit for University Heights by um, moving it in that direction. And I think that along with, uh, you know, just the i was sitting having more resources to take on a project like this i think i agree with casey and bobby that it makes sense to what resources would we need to do this that we don't have specifically uh, we have resources steve you want to go into the resources i mean we have like you and we have josiah and we have a uh, we have a team that we, I mean, Steve talk, talked about it a little bit last time. You so want to resources a, was the wrong selection of word, but I guess I understand it's more around like the, the process and the procedures for, you know, that we don't have like all the documentation of the type of the project for this. It would, it would take some work to. to yeah, come I, to oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. So the thing I was going to say, whether you call it resources or, you know, process or, you know, I mean, if a person, if an entity, if the university, you know, Ben and Nate uh, and David wanted to uh, build the proposed active community uh, development in Iowa City, uh, they go down to the city planning office and say, what do we do? And they, people there would say, well, what do you tell us a little more? And, and they they basically get them a form. Um, it, you know, they have they have zoning uh, uh, in place and 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 what are called overlays that um, that uh, are 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 in place and, and staff would direct the the developer to, to you know those kinds of procedures and and the developer could look at them and say okay. I, I see what's there and, and I, I see how I can fit what I want into what's what's available. And if something had to be changed, there, there's a lot of detail to it, but you know, uh, there are allowances and sometimes there's things called bonuses. Well, we're gonna do this with some environmentally uh, uh, sensitive development. So maybe we could uh, get a little consideration on this other part. And, and, uh, and, and the city of Iowa City just kind of has that all ready to go, all right? In our city, uh, if somebody came in and said, "Hey, same thing. We, you know, we'd like to build this, uh, develop this. What do we do?" Um, well, then, um, you know, anybody who's answering that question on the first, in the first instance, like maybe Chris, the city clerk, or or Louise, the mayor, they're going to sort of say, "I, we're not really sure. Uh, maybe we should call Josiah or Steve or somebody." 
and, and eventually that developer is going to be told, okay, well, this is a, this is, you know, in the C commercial zone. And, and, and so the first thing we have to do is we have to rezone it. And then what do you want to do? And, and we need a process. We, we don't really have a process. Probably the council would say, well, go see the zoning commission. And I say probably because that's what the council has done in the past. And then the zoning commission would sort of um, run its uh, process, and maybe have some public hearings, certainly have some public meetings, uh, get some flesh on the bones of what the developer has in mind, maybe have some give and take with the, with the developer, eventually make a recommendation to the council, and then the council would have to, to vote on that recommendation in terms of a zoning uh, or a rezoning, and then there would be additional uh, applications and considerations uh, that would uh, in all likelihood come to be and I say again, in all likelihood, based upon the prior developments that the council has considered, or the city has considered, you know, so with OUP, um, the first big thing was to rezone the property and, and adopt a, pro a procedure for considering a development. And then, and then the developer had to go through that procedure. And I don't mean that that was, you know, an improper or, or um, particularly onerous. I mean, you know, OUP is a good example and it's a poor example because it was extremely controversial and that, that chewed up a lot of time and resources for good reason. Democracy uh, takes time and resources. But mm -hmm. that's, what, uh, that's what I mean uh, when I hear somebody say, well, we don't have the resources. Well, we don't have the staff and the process in place. Now, can we get the staff and the process in place? Absolutely. We've done it before. But, um, but you know, if you're a developer, you know, if you look at Iowa City, you kind of know the score. Uh, and if you look at University Heights, it's kind of a blank canvas, which could be good for you. It might, might be a little, little mysterious for you. But um, I think that's what I would say about that, that question. Well, I, I see you, your example of OUP is a prime example of it, that we did it once. And it's not like we're going to be doing this all the time every year. I mean, it, this looks like a onesie and we're done. So I, I don't know why we're, we're acting almost skittish over this because we don't have the resources, but, but clearly we did it once already. And like I say, it's not like we have a whole bunch more potential things where we don't have the staff that, yeah, we probably have to invest in some kind of a staff and procedure and, and ordinances and all that. But I just see this as a one-time, one and done. And, uh, and my biggest thing is I do not want to give up any uh, jurisdiction or annex, you know, any annexation onto our property, just for the sole purpose of then we have no say of what happens up there. I mean, what happens if uh, it turns into a loud party or something, and we have to depend on Iowa City Police to come to respond because it's no longer in our jurisdiction where we have our police department just, you know, 500 feet around the corner. And for me, I, I see that more as a, uh, and also a benefit of having localized police more of a community feel. I mean, we get to know all our officers on a first name basis. I just think that would be a win-win for us and for them. That way we can still have somewhat control on, you know, the ongoings and the processes. And, uh, and that's my interpretation. I think it would be beneficial, I mean, down the road for both parties. And, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of more in favor of moving our, uh, Boundary West and, and incorporate it into our our um, our fold, I guess you could say. But that's where I kind of stand. Would anybody else like to comment or say what they feel or how they want to vote or respond to Doug or? Uh, I would say I, I certainly respect Doug's point of view, but I'm not ready to give up $73,000 a year for that, that kind of control. It just doesn't seem like a, a reasonable trade for me. So that's why I'm voting uh, to annex the whole property into Iowa City. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I totally, yeah, completely respect points, Doug. Um, I don't disagree with them. Um, but yeah, I think I would still vote to move the jurisdiction to Iowa City. And actually an interesting point I hadn't really, I guess, considered before tonight, I think David made that, 
you know, we could consider in the 28E agreement, you know, having some, you know, we can decide what level of input we would want on, on the design, at least as far as like the, the design process. And that doesn't address the, you know, community and the police, you know, kind of the police jurisdiction uh, concern that you raised. Would anyone else like to comment at all? If I mean, not, the only, the only thing I have to say, I think I, I think it's very kind of Iowa City to let us kind of lead out and take the first step, and that that's a very generous offer. I don't know. I feel I, I kind of think that, like Casey said, it's it's. I mean, Iowa City has got the resources to make this a smooth process for the developers. They'll do a great job. Um, for us, not having the resources to do that, it would be a you know, it would be a, a, a big undertaking. And I think that financially, it's a good, it, it's, it's a good thing to do for the citizens of U Heights, just having that extra income, which we'll be able to put to use in ways I think that will really benefit from in the big picture. Okay. Did anyone else like to comment? because we have the motion and the second before you. I don't have anything to add, Louise. I, I think I'm in agreement with Bobby, and although I do, I do respect the points that Doug's made. But. Okay, so uh, we have a motion and second to move the direction uh, of the boundary east, which would mean it would be in the city of Iowa City. Uh, the the project would be moving the boundary east. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. No. Okay, so it's four one. Doug voting no. Thank you. Carried. Um, so, please, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for taking the time, and especially thanks to Steve Ballard and Louise. It's been a about a <laughs> six, eight, ten month kind of conversation, and just appreciate you guys working with us. And we look forward to collaborating with everybody as we get the full agreement here into place. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. You know, and, and Louisa, I, I think it's really good how you're having the, for instance, the hotel developer come, you know, every meeting and give progress reports and answer questions. And I would encourage the development team, you know, regardless if it's in Iowa City or, or, or uh, University Heights to, to give regular reports like that. It, 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 regardless of the jurisdiction, you're sharing in the tax benefits you're sharing in the success of the development is going to be your neighbor either way. And so I, I would encourage them to, you know, give regular updates as, as we go through the development, the construction uh, to the grand opening. And Ben's the hotel Ben's development. Are, ben said you're more than happy to join in every. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, you just put pressure on us. Those hotel developments are hard to, uh, hard to compete with. So uh, it looks good. So Steve, you're going to start the next steps correct Could yes i sure will i'll uh, i will communicate to the city of iowa city uh that this preliminary vote has been uh, has been taken and um and um we'll uh, get get to work to, to see what we can get done okay and i want to thank kent ralston again the from the mpo thank you kent for you and your staff working on this that was very helpful to uh, the council and I, and appreciate you uh, <coughs> readily saying you do it. What, just because we wanted spur of the moment. That was so kind of you. Thank you. We appreciate you. And uh, so we're going to move on to the next. I think some people may want to drop out, but of course you can come thank you. to the yeah, rest. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Uh, we have, uh, Steve has second consideration of ordinance number 246, which is regulating refuse yard waste and recycling. Uh, you want to talk about that, Steve, some? 
Uh, only if uh, anyone has uh, has questions. Uh, this is like I say, second consideration. Uh, the council's had this issue before it a few times. Um, so what the ordinance does is it, it first of all treats uh, owner occupied homes and residences the same as rental homes and residences. Then it says that you have to uh, store your uh, refuse and recycling containers behind, you know, basically the front facade. So you can't leave it out in the front of your house, um, regardless to where the lot line is, regardless of what little alcoves you might have. If, if you know you want, need to get it back behind the front of your house, and then the aspirational elements say it'd be nice if you could make it so you can't, you know, people can't see your uh, refuse and recycling containers. You know, from any city street. So that was uh, sort of the, that's what the ordinance says based upon the discussions of the council and I think some of the compromises that the, that the council reached. So second consideration of 246 is before you. And Steve, this has been before the council uh, several different months and they made good suggestions and they're incorporated. And I want to say, could you mention if they want to collapse the vote, that vote would have to come first to collapse the vote? That's true. And it, that's true. Uh, if the council desires to collapse, uh, anytime the council wants to adopt an ordinance um, in less than three uh, readings, uh, then uh, so, so the council may collapse three into one or it can collapse uh, the last two into one. That's what's, that's what's before you tonight. Either you vote uh, on 246 as a second consideration or if you're inclined to say, look, this is second consideration, but really we've been talking about it a while, we're comfortable collapsing it, you may do that. And that would be the first vote you take. It would be to collapse the second and third readings. That vote uh, takes a, a four uh, vote majority and, and then you would vote on the ordinance. And if, if both of those votes uh, pass, I, then- the I can motion to collapse then. Okay, if that's the that right me? verbiage. Yeah, that was me, Louise. Thank you, Bobby. So Bobby is going to motion to collapse the vote uh, from the, sec the, the last two, the second to the third. Is there a second? I'll second that, Louise. Second. Please, uh, okay, uh, discussion. Uh, I'm going to... Um, only in part because I, I feel this is like a, a free vote and, and that uh, uh, we've talked about it enough and I think there's plenty of support for it. But I'm personally opposed to this. I think we've got a lot of 1950 garages and in walking through University Ice, I find that it's almost impossible to completely hide the, the trash or uh, recycling uh, containers. And uh, I, I particularly, I, I went through having gone to University Heights every day for the last three and a half months, I saw one trash can that was slightly open because they couldn't fit everything into it. And that was an owner occupied house. So I think that if we're shooting to make University Heights look less junky, this is not the way to do it. That um, it, it makes it impossible to enforce and it's uh, kind of an onerous burden on our citizens. So I'm opposed to the ordinance. Okay. Uh, so is there any other uh, council that wants to talk about discussing of collapsing the vote? <laughs> okay, uh, we do a roll call vote for collapsing too, right, Steve? That's correct. Yes, okay, roll call vote. Swales? Aye. Casey? I, I'm in favor of collapsing the vote. O'Sullivan? Aye. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. Carried? Okay, now the motion is for the ordinance number 246 amending, and this would be the second and third reading uh, for uh, 239 regulating yard waste and recycling. Is there a motion for that? So moved. Motion by Casey? All second. And second by Bobby. Okay, discussion. So this doesn't require that it be out of sight. That's an aspiration. It yeah. just has to be behind the front facade of the house. Just to clarify that. Correct, Steve? That's correct. Thank you. And also the one 
at least for the rental, the current one is even more strict, right? The current one for rental properties is out of completely out of sight. So this that, that's right. Is seeing the owner versus rental. Yeah. Well, I too share the same concerns that Casey has too with these older places where they're just really isn't a, a, the perfect place to put them and i just wondering how flexible are we going to be with this or anytime you pass it in an ordinance and you know that means punitive right away so i guess i'd like to see more of a, an educational thing where maybe somebody from the city council would go over and help them find the right place for in an educational way instead of a punitive way and uh, you know i think as long as there's a reasonable intent to you know try to hide it the best they can i mean I don't know how a one size fits all is going to work. So um, I'm not for sure if I'm going to support this or not right now, the way that it's, it's written, as long as it's done with reasonable expectations and, and intent to do your best that you can hide it out of sight. I, I, I'm okay with that, but to come, come across another heavy handed ordinance, I, I just, I'm not in favor of that at all. Casey, I'm 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 challenged by your optimism on the right way to. Uh, how did you quote that? Keep it beautiful, or whatever. Aside from aside from things like this, what's your? I mean, I'm I would love to believe that there's another way. So, in in reality, I, what's your? Give me your train of thought on that. Um, you know, my my thought, Bobby, is it's an ordinance that isn't really enforceable. I mean, we kind of like it to be, but um, there's just, you know, I'd look at these small garages. I had one and I couldn't fit the, uh, the refuse container in there. And it, it had to be right out in front of the house forever because, you know, we couldn't get it around the corner in the winter. That's where we threw the snow. And, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't enforceable. And then the idea of making sure that the top fits tightly just seems like, you know, we're trying to micromanage our citizen, citizenry, and it's something that we really don't have a hell of a lot of control over. But I, I'm, I mean, you know, the, the will of the majority is, is going to be fine with me, but I just don't, I, I just oppose this ordinance. I don't hold it against anybody who is in favor of it. No, certainly. I, I think that my, the challenge for me comes into, like, I don't, I'm on board with that idea, that sentiment of not wanting to micromanage everyone. I just don't know in a town that's so diverse and everyone has different standards, you know, how to do that effectively or aside from just like saying, here's how we want it as a city. I'm, I'm with you, but I'm, well, but I'm, and I think, I think Lisa makes a good point that it's aspirational mm -hmm. and Sarah makes a good point that it's less onerous than it is now. So there are good reasons to support it. Mm -hmm. But, but I feel that, uh, you know, this is a, a level of, of micromanaging that I can't support. Well, I can give you some history. And Steve probably remembers having to call me and say, why don't you run for council someday? <laughs> because I was complaining so often. I mean, we had a lot of people in a certain area that just kind of pile their trash around. I mean, you're not necessarily seeing that today. I'm not saying that, but we really had a problem. Uh, you know, Stan's not here anymore to, to speak to that, but the block was kind of a mess and the trash would blow around and nobody would pick it up. So this is, you know, it's nice to have these kind thoughts, but they don't always translate into reality. And I don't think this is onerous. I think, you know, we're not saying out of sight. We are saying behind the front of the house. And there are places where they have it sitting in front of the house. I mean, I've, I've seen them. So, and if you can put it out of sight, please do. But we're not coming to force you to. So I think it's reasonable. And like I said, you may not need it today, but a few turnovers in mm. properties and you might need it again. So there it is. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, so this is the uh, last consideration of number 246. Uh, 
amending ordinance number 239 regarding refuge yard waste and recycling. Um, roll call vote. Casey? Opposed. O'Sullivan? Uh, aye. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. Swales? No. Three at three, two. Carried. Carried. Okay, very good. Okay. You know, I'd, I'd like to say, uh, Chris, it's too bad we can't get uh, uh, Carrie to vote on it. <laughs> Who, Lori, you mean? Lori? Or? Carrie, as in carried. Oh. <laughs> because I thought for the longest time, I thought Chris was saying Carrie, and she was saying Carrie. <laughs> I thought, Who the hell is Carrie? You know, That's all right. Got I got it. it. Okay. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> it's a it. bad joke. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. Okay, thank you. Let's go on to first consideration of ordinance number 247, amending ordinance 279. And this has to do with respect to several items, including uh, rooming houses, commercial parking, and requirements for rental housing permit applications. Steve, would you give a quick review? I'm happy to. Um... This gets a little complicated, and I apologize for that. I don't think my review will, but uh, we'll see about that as well. Um, so the, the, there are, the reason it's complicated is that there's, there's different moving parts, and I tried to set it up in a menu format. I'm not sure I did a really good job of that. It's kind of hard, uh, but in any event, because the council may want to say, yeah, we want to remove this idea that you can't have a... Um, uh, you know, a commercial parking space, but, but we want to keep that part about not having a rooming house or vice versa. Or the council might want to say, we want to keep the restriction on a rooming house, but we don't want people to have to, to, to say, uh, you know, um, who, you know, with the ages of the people that are in the, in the, in the, uh, in the unit, because uh, that's, that's onerous and nobody uses that information anyway. And of course I'm going to say, then how do you enforce the other, but that, that gets into questions that you'd have to ask your, your enforcement people, um, Brian and somebody. So my point is that, that unlike most ordinances, this proposed ordinance 247 certainly is not a, you know, take it or leave it, vote for everything or reject everything. I mean, as individual council members, you obviously have every right to vote for everything or, or reject everything. But if, but the way that uh, I understood the council's direction in May, and what I tried to do was to, 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 in my report, perhaps more than the ordinance, say, all right, there, there are these different, uh, you know, different uh, ideas or concepts, repealing the ban on, on rooming houses, uh, removing the requirement that landlords provide in, tenant information about whether they're, you know, an undergrad or not. Uh, removing the ban on commercial property and then removing uh, the requirement that a landlord say who's going to be mowing the lawn, landlord or tenant. And so what I would uh, encourage the council to do is to, uh, is to provide some guidance uh, on, those, on those four items with the idea that, uh, that then uh, I can revamp this ordinance and have it back to you, you know, in July, if you, uh, unless you have a special meeting between now and then, I'll have it back to you the next time you meet is what I mean. Uh, and, 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 you know, if, if the council says, yeah, we want to keep the commercial parking ban, well, then I'll just remove that part. And then you're, you're ready for kind of a second consideration may not be in exactly the same form as your first consideration because, you know, everything was, was there tonight and you've told me to take some of it out that may be a good reason to collapse a couple of readings. We've got the deadline for rental applications needing to be sent out to, uh, to property owners or be available for property owners. And so that may be a reason to uh, collapse a couple of readings too. And um, I, I'm not usually the cheerleader for collapsing, but timing wise, and uh, you may have to consider that, you may wanna consider that uh, with these uh, provisions. So. I guess that's what I would say. I don't really have anything else to add to uh, my report, except to say that I, I gave you the history, you know, only because as I reflected on uh, the council's discussion and reflected on the fact that, that there are, you know, the, the four of the council people are, are new to the council this year, 
I just wanted you to know where this had where this had came, had come from some of these ideas and um, I certainly hope that my my explanation and my comments weren't um, taken as a, you know as a, a viewpoint or a, mm -hmm. an argument to go one way or the other I just wanted you to know that there had been a process and, and I thought it would be good for you to have a, a good sense of that history. I also want to say I invited Brian Jensen, who's uh, our rental housing inspector, and so that he could hear discussion and know what you want enforced, and he can also comment if you have a question for him. Thank you for coming, Brian. I appreciate it. So, uh, does anyone from the council want to uh, discuss some of the points? Uh, should, should we make a motion, Louise, or or oh, just? I'll make a motion. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to articulate this motion, but it's to consider that uh, ordinances that uh, and that's ordinance number. Two forty-seven. Two forty-seven. Okay. I, I still didn't hear it. Anyway, um, so I I had a um, oh. I'll, I'll leave it at that. We need a second before I'll, we. Can... I'll second. I'll second so we can keep going. Okay. Um, I, I had a uh, letter exchange with uh, some of the members of University Ice today, in which I copied off the council, and um, I think they were most most concerned about what they call uh, allowing uh, commercial parking, and and. Um, uh, I was persuaded that there may be some unintended uh, consequences. What commercial parking amounts to is that, you know, basically allowing employees from the university um, uh, hospital and uh, VA hospital and uh, the University of Iowa employees to use those parking spaces which are designated. It's not intended to expand the parking in any, in any way. But it sounds like that may be an in, unintended consequence of this. Um, but the the purpose of it was really to simplify uh, the uh, rental agreement, which is I think it goes on for three pages, um, down you know down to just a couple of pages. And the only way to uh, enforce that was by getting the license plates numbers uh, and then asking. Uh, uh, Troy's department to go out and make sure that the license plate numbers that they show correspond to the tenants who live there and that there aren't any commercial uh, so-called commercial uh, people using it and that seemed like uh, you know a rather difficult process and we've been supplying license plates for quite some time and um, I think Chris addressed herself and Chris correct me if I'm uh, uh, misquoting you, but she said that we really haven't had much uh, request for that information in the last two years, and that's why um, you know I, I felt that it's it's kind of a hassle for the owners. It's a it's a, uh, a bit of a hassle for the tenants. That uh, the other part of this ordinance is that we should hold the landlord responsible and not try to get between a landlord and a tenant. Um, and uh, I forget what the other provisions were, but but uh, we're basically trying to simplify the rental agreement and rely on on uh, other ordinances that that uh, uh, address our concerns, which is noise um, and several several other other issues. So uh, that's the rationale that we've got here, and it's pretty well summarized in my letter. I think that Laura's comments, earlier comments, are. are something I'd like to take to heart. Um, and I read in the New York Times uh, that, that the mom and pop rentals were one of the best sources of uh, affordable housing in the United States. And really, you know, University Heights doesn't have the, the money to address these uh, kind of social concerns and uh, giving a little bit, little bit uh, simplifying things for, for uh, uh, apartment owners, I think, is a, is something to be. Uh, it makes it easier for the staff, makes it easier for us. The other issue was um, uh, rooming houses, and uh, you know, I thought that uh, you know, enabling four construction workers to live together, but not 
four sociologists uh, attending the university to live together seem to me to be the kind of exclusion that in, in this day and age, uh, it's a kind of exclusionary practice that dis, despite um, Doug's belief that he'd, he'd be happy to, uh, he might not be happy, but he said he could legally defend that position, I would hate to put him in a position to have to do so. And that was my rationale for eliminating the rooming house thing. That was put in as a response to the legislation, the state legislation, which uh, didn't allow us to put a cap on on rentals, and it didn't allow us to uh, have um, uh, blood marriage or adoption as a criteria for allowing tenants in. And it being a vestige of that that uh, legislation, which has been disavowed anyway, I thought we could do without that uh, further. It's only it's only allowed outside of the R1 zoning, and there's very little uh, in University Heights that isn't R1 zoning, and uh, I think that's a that's a pretty strong rationale. I have to admit I'm I'm uh, a little bit biased, and that is unless I see a good reason for an ordinance or can be persuaded of it, um, then I'm then I'm I'm liable not to want to not to want to add that uh, in, into the uh, ordinances. But I do think that uh, the people that wrote me the letter um, feel very strongly about uh, the commercial parking and that university looking like, you know, having too many parking spaces. And uh, uh, I think there might be some unintended consequences for that. So I continue to be opposed to the uh, rooming house ordinance. I continue to be po uh, opposed to, um, uh, the other the other things that I have just discussed, but as far as the uh, commercial parking, I would rescind that. I mean, I'd allow that that uh, prohibition to stand. Thanks, Louise. Uh, sorry to be so long winded. No, I I just I'm sorry. I didn't really understand the motion, and it's you made a motion and Bobby seconded and I somehow didn't follow it. What was the motion? It was to approve, specifically approve that uh, ordinance. So it's the first uh, it allows us. It allows us to simplify the uh, rental agreement as a result. So you're voting for first consideration of ordinance number 247? That's correct. Okay. So we didn't do it. Okay. My, and my thought process in seconding was we discuss it and, and figure yeah. out if, if it's what we want to actually, if yeah. we want to make changes to it or not based on those things. Is that not correct? That's right. So we can discuss it, yes. Yeah. yeah. So if I may, so what I heard Casey say was, you know, he moved adoption of the ordinance so that for discussion, Bobby seconded it for discussion, and Casey and said he's in favor of getting rid of the rooming house prohibition keeping the commercial property prohibition and getting rid of the landlords have to tell us who's mowing the lawn if, if i got it right yeah, that's correct steve and you said it a hell of a lot more succinctly than i did <laughs> uh let me see if i can follow suit with all that i think i am in favor of keeping the rooming house prohibition i think that with that I mean, I could go into a Casey length dialogue about that. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. I, I think that it's, it is something we can limit. And I don't think that, I don't think that there are a lot of college students who are put out that they can't live in university heights. You know, I think it's, it mostly affects rental or owners, rental owners. Um, and as a, you know, I guess I'm okay not having rooming house as a neighbor again that, that, that's just how i think about it personally like if it were me would i want to um four college students or you know whatever living next to me i wouldn't want you, me when i was realize in college, that, living next that, to me that's r1 only and we're just taking it out completely say again we're, we're, what is what is steve what is yeah, so the, the the prohibition on rooming houses only applies in the R1 zone and then the Burkdale development. You know, I mean, right. then think, so think about it. I mean, so so Grandview Court, they could have a rooming house, meaning, meaning four 
undergraduate right. four or more undergrad except they couldn't because the way that those units are configured other portions of our ordinances would say you don't have enough square footage you don't have enough bedrooms so you know i don't think at least but that's but that is the prohibition is in the r1 zone in our neighborhoods with houses Right, the R1 zone is every, oh, I'm sorry. Single family houses. Yeah. Right, right. The R1 zone is everything in the city, except the Stella building, OUP, now the hotel, uh, the Finkbine property, and, and Burkdale. So what this, what the ordinance now says is that in everything except all, what I just mentioned, plus put Burkdale back in, uh, you can't have a rooming house. Right. Doesn't it say we, more than that though, Steve? Well, yeah, I mean, it says a lot more than that. I'm just saying when it comes to that rooming house, like where would that apply or where wouldn't that apply? The prohibition against rooming houses now only applies in the R1 zone in Burkdale. So by eliminating the rooming house um, ordinance, then we would be allowing it in R1. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right, in Burkdale. Okay, so Bobby's interpretation was correct. He could potentially have four students living next door to him. He could have 12 in some cases. <laughs> and Louise, is, if Louise puts her house on the market. <laughs> Yeah, could so, have I do know that might have been an exaggeration, but given the the it's bedrooms requirements and the bedrooms, I mean, it's really it's all a function of the size of the house, basically. But yeah. Well, yeah. why don't we just ban rooming houses? Period. No matter what zone they're in, I'm fine with that. <laughs> well, we. I don't know. I mean, we're not going to have rooming houses. That's what we have, though. I mean, that's a We're not going to have rooming houses in any of the commercial or R3 districts that we've got now. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just ban all rooming houses? So well, we I, have a we have a ban on rooming houses. We, we do. That's currently. effective. That's doing what we want it to do, which is try to limit the number of houses that become rental. Same with commercial parking. That was part of it. Part of it was we had parking lots, things that look like parking lots in places of town, people that were adding additional parking. I mean, you all got letters from the same people I did, have. and I had some phone calls from a number of people, and, and they were all on this same page. We don't want rooming houses, and we don't want to allow commercial parking. Well, why don't we just eliminate rooming houses and so we don't have to mess around with it? We're not going to, we don't have rooming houses anyway. Because we have an ordinance. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, I think there's a disconnect and uh, we're, we're missing the mark here somewhere. I think you guys are both wanting the same thing, if I'm not mistaken, right? Okay. Yes, I mean, they are. Are you saying, I mean, Right now, we are not, uh, the, no one can have a rooming house currently. And I think what we're voting on is, is keeping that the same or getting rid of it entirely and letting them have rooming houses. Okay. I get you, Bobby. Is that correct? Am I right in yes. that? Yeah, yeah. Right now, yes. rooming houses are prohibited in the R1 zone and in Burkdale. If you adopt Ordinance 247, as it's written, then you then people may have rooming houses. They will be allowed in the R1 zone in Burkdale. With respect to other zones, why don't we just ban them everywhere? Um, that's not what the prior councils did. Uh, I, I would defer to, I mean, first of all, I would defer to the council. If that's what you want to do, that's easy to do, okay? I would defer to uh, Brian Jensen to say, if you think about Burkdale, you know, I, I don't I don't know. Are there are there units over there where where somebody could have four or more people, you know, legally with our you know square footage configurations? I don't know if there are or not. Uh, I think in prior councils they said, well, whatever Burkdale can do with square footage, we're okay with that. That's different enough than you know Highland Drive. But anyway. So I think I think if we're all 
saying the same thing, then we can't adopt this ordinance as it's written currently. As, as it's proposed, I mean, as it's proposed. That's correct. Yeah, I think that's right, Bobby. And I, I'm taking good notes about like which parts of it you want <laughs> in and out so I can refine it. So is that, can we move on from the rooming house part of this? You bet. The you rest bet. Of it? So, so every we're not going to change. We're not going to change the rooming house. But but let me find out from Brian. Um, Brian, what's your take on rooming houses? He's muted. Can he hear me though? He's on mute. Yeah, I'm mute, Brian. Can we take him off? There, there you go. There you go. What's your take on rooming houses, Brian? Personally, when I kind of brought some of this stuff up, I was in favor of not changing the rooming house, even leaving it as is, but trying to make it easier for myself, Chris, Terry, and the landlords just as far as paperwork goes. Or as far as me personally, and I don't, you know, I don't get to vote, but I, I'm going to enforce whatever you guys want me to enforce. I would say there's been a lot of work to put the rooming house thing in there over the past years. From what I've talked to other people, I don't think a lot of people are looking at having to eliminate it. So it's okay with me then. Yeah. So Brian, you'd like to take it off the form. Is that what you're saying? You'd like no, to basically, basically what I'm saying is, is let's leave the rooming house restriction in there. As far as the other forms, as far as disclosures, I want to try to make that easier for both myself, Chris, and the property owners, as far as that goes. So whatever Steve needs to do to keep that enforcement of the rooming house in there, that's what, that's what my suggestion would be. So let me, if I may, uh, follow up with what Brian just said and, 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 um, and uh, Sarah, I think it was, or if it wasn't Lisa. I'm taking notes. I don't have my zoom up. I can't see who's talking. Anyway, um, so so here's the deal. So if you say, well, let's keep the prohibition on rooming houses. Okay, that's easy. I can change the ordinance that says that. But then we move to that part of, well, what about the form and ease, ease for staff and ease for property owners? Is there a reason if we're going to prohibit rooming houses, is, is there still a reason to say to a landlord, now look, you got to tell us, Who's living there, and are they are they an undergraduate student? And 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 what what did you do to find out if they were an undergraduate student? Okay, um, and and I I respect Brian saying well you know whatever Steve still wants in there to make it enforceable, and of course I'm going to turn that right around. <laughs> uh, I I'm not the boots on the ground. I mean if it comes to a violation and we need to go to court and prosecute it, I'm going to do that. But, uh, but well before it would ever get to that point, if the question is, all right, if we prohibit rooming houses and we don't ask landlords on the front end, hey, who's living there? And by mm -hmm. the way, it can't be more than, you know, it can't be four undergrads. You might not know that about our ordinance, but that's why we're asking in the form. And what did you do to find out? I, I don't know. You know, how, how are you going to ever prosecute it? How are you going to find out? And, and then the other side of that coin is to ask Brian and Chris, is having that information, even if it's cumbersome, yeah. is having that information in the form an effective way and you know, maybe the only way or at least a primary way mm -hmm. to find out and to give notice to people. So you don't come in in October and say, oh my gosh, you've got a, you've got a rooming house. Well, I didn't, so I didn't know that, you know what, you know, well, Nothing on the form told me I couldn't have a rooming house. Well, can, well it's in our order. Can, can you leave like the rooming houses or, you know, this is what a rooming house is and then go back and ask for the property owner when it comes to it, like, you know, at our request, you yeah, know, disclose that information. That yeah, in other words, have the form just say, boom, rooming houses are defined like this and you can't have them. Yeah. Yes. And then say, upon, you know, reasonable yeah. request by the yeah, city. Provided upon request. Yes, yeah, something like that. Sure. Yeah. And Basically, just, in a situation where we're having issues, request that information, essentially. 
So can I interject something here? Because I had several people that contacted me on telephone say that the form should have the names that they were formerly used. I don't know if this is, I don't know this for myself, but, but the rental, the housing inspector used to make use of the names. Um, that it's a way to make sure that there's not turnover mm -hmm. in the rental property. Um, the license plate numbers, which I know are also considered cumbersome. And I don't think that the police want to use them, but if we have them on file, they might come in handy with some of the situations that we are having right now. Somebody can say, well, this, particular car that's been there for however long is registered to this house or not registered or I mean we could have it on file without having to enter it into a spreadsheet and it's there if you need it. May I and jump in? Go right when you're ahead. done Lisa. I'm sorry. Well I'm just saying that several people mentioned this is a tool to use for enforcement that if we have it on file it might be useful at some point. And we talk about enforcement, so we could shorten the form. I mean, can we just say on the form, go to the website or and, and read for yourself, or can we provide something on one of the pages that one of you guys works up? Can we provide a variety of links to, here's the trash information, here's the disorderly house, here's the rental code rather than spelling it all out in a three page form. But people, several people, like I said, say well, you need to have this information on file. So I will stop talking now. May I speak? Chris, go for it. So with all due respect to Steve about information and forms and, and enforcement, the forms in my mind are administrative in nature. They are not the ordinance. The ordinance has the rules and the policies. And I completely agree with Lisa that we direct people to the website or to the appropriate spot. We don't put all the rules on our building permits, the building codes that they have to follow. So again, with all due respect, we don't have the metrics supporting four pages of documents that we may use. And we all know of a problem property in University Heights that we've been dealing with and they never turned in forms. So it's kind of a moot point. You're gonna have problems. You're going to have places with no problems. Um, I would hope that we could do something from an administrative standpoint that we can get the information that is needed. Personally, I need contact information. I don't wanna speak for Brian or Terry or Steve, but I see this as an administrative issue and a policy issue. And I am not authorized to do policy. Uh, authorizations but I am the one who's going to work on the administrative and we are already behind on getting these things ready and submitted and, and mailed out soon or at least emailed. The forms don't enforce the policies. That's going to be the council. That's going to be Steve, Terry, and Brian. So I hope as we're discussing this we can see that there in my mind and please correct me Steve if I'm wrong there are administrative issues and we can direct people to the rules. We've said it time and time again, the property owners are responsible for what happens on their property. They have to be in compliance. That can, they can go to the website. I am happy to send the ordinance out 2,700 times if need be, but it's not the form. The form is not the golden ticket that gets you in the, in the chocolate factory. Right. We need well, basic information. It's, it's, and it's then, a high, I think it's may a I have one name. more, Sorry. one more thing? To Lisa's point about license plate numbers and cars, as I remember from the previous council, uh, Nate Peterson was asked to take pictures, be it on the camera or actual pictures of cars and license plate numbers. Is that not a mechanism that we can use for the parking issues? Take it away, Steve. Yeah, the only thing I was gonna say is, it, to me it's kind of a hybrid. I, I think you're right, uh, the, the form doesn't set the, the rule or the policy, the form's administrative, but what, you know, what, what has happened in the past with other issues is somebody says, oh, we don't we, don't we have a prohibition against like four undergrads or more? Yeah, we do. It's called a rooming house. We prohibit those. Well, I think that house over there has a rooming house. I think they're operating as a rooming house. So my question is, does it do the city 
from an enforcement standpoint at that stage any good to say, well, pick, pull out their form. What did they tell us about who was living there? Or are we better off saying, now nah, we'll just start from scratch at that point? Or, you know, something in the middle and say, okay, we have that provision in the ordinance that says, if we ask you about this information, then you have to give it to us. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, and I, I won't be involved in that, except somebody will call and say, don't we have a, a prohibition? And I'm going to say, yeah, but I'm not really sure how we're enforcing it. So that's where the form kind of has a, a you know, a foot in both camps of, you know, it's not the, it's not the rule, but it, it, it's an opportunity for the city to find out information that would be necessary to enforce the rule. It's the city's, probably the city's best opportunity, or at least one of them. But that's, you know, I defer to the council and to Brian and Chris, because like I said, that's, I'm not the one doing that. But, but shouldn't we be able to call the landlord and say, hey, who are the people that are in your house? Shouldn't he know who's in his house? I think we could, yeah. I think we could arrange it that way. So instead of requiring all of that information for, from everybody on every rental housing form, I think we could just put the notice, say, this is what a rooming house is. This is where they're prohibited or they're prohibited everywhere. Right. And, um, and on, you know, you know, within 14 day notice or something, if we ask you who is living in your house and are they undergrads, you got to tell us. Well, that would put the monkey on the landlord's back instead of our back. Well, I think if it's information on a form that's in a file, there's no monkey involved. It's there, and if we need it, we look at it. And if they're turning over the people in their rental property every few weeks, that would make a difference to us, would it not? Don't we, don't we say something about that? I don't know. People get I mean, I just think having the names on a form is something that would be useful to us. Possibly, you know, having the, the license plate numbers would in some way at some time be useful to us. How do apartments handle people and overflow of people? I mean, are people who rent apartments, are they required to share their license plates and <laughs> social security, blood type? I mean, I don't I think know. maybe license plates at apartment complexes, but I don't think it's, I think it's apples and oranges. We're talking about our neighborhoods and individual homes and trying to use this as an enforcement tool. Mm -hmm. And then we have landlords that would say, well, I wanna know who's parked in your driveway and I need to know who's, who's there and whose car they are and who's driving them. I mean, I get that pushback a lot of times too. And I know it's apples and oranges again, I understand that, but people will pretty much tell you none of your business, but you know, it is kind of our business if you're gonna qualify for rental property. So it's a slippery slope. Yeah. I think what you just said is correct. Yeah. I want to make a suggestion in listening to this. Uh, uh, I think that we're at a deadline mm -hmm. and maybe we need to keep the rental form as it is and maybe go ahead and do some work sessions or some special meetings and go through these things. I'm just... You know, Louise, I know you want to save time at the meeting. I think that's a good goal. And we've only got maybe 45 minutes to an hour to finish up on our uh, priorities at the next special meeting. And I'm wondering if, you know, we could devote an hour or less to this at that same meeting and get the, uh, get the uh, results into Chris so she can get those formed out in a timely fashion rather than schedule a whole nother uh, uh, special meeting. We could just try to do double duty with that with our priorities and I'm, I'm big on priorities but i'm uh, uh, you know mindful of uh the uh, deadline on this thing and i know you want to get it done and, and i wouldn't have any problem with with uh just uh trying to add this to that meeting yeah, I'd be good one thing that. i would say about that is i need the direction ahead of the meeting so i can have it in a form for you to vote on okay when I say the meeting, I don't know if it's that meeting, but before some meeting, I... So if we keep the form... Sorry, I, never mind. <laughs> if we keep uh, it as it is, 
we're fine, correct? No, we're not fine. Because it I'm, doesn't I'm kind of asking it. Steve this question. If we keep well, I didn't, I didn't as realize. It is. I thought you're. I thought you're throwing that question out to the group, and I would no, say I it's not. It's not fine, because it's an overly complex form that puts an undue burden on our staff, landlords, and ourselves. So yeah, it's you know we can simplify it. So you wanted to ask Steve what, Lisa? What I what I just said. If, if we keep it as it is, we need to take no action. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, um, that's true. That's true. What about some, I, mean, if, I feel if like there just, are some things on the form that we all agreed didn't go, like who's responsible, like have them marking who's responsible for like mowing and snow removal and listing out like the text of some of the ordinances. I mean, even at a minimum, removing those things that aren't as tied to some of these ordinances would shorten the form. Like, is it worth doing kind of like a stopgap to help reduce the form? I think it could be. I don't know. I mean, I think uh, you could shorten the text on the form. I would agree, and I, and I like the provision that says uh, this is what a this is what a rooming house is. Um, and if you have any further questions on this, go to the ordinance. And, and uh, also, also, we'd like we'd like the. The, uh, if we are requesting the names of the tenants, um, you will have to provide that. Otherwise, we're not going to, you know, we're going to only at, only as necessary. Or you could be in danger of losing your rental permit. That's it. What other... caught people's attention two years ago was the threat of losing their permit. Mm -hmm. Financial penalties are... Pretty good incentive. Yes, that is what's going to catch their attention. So I don't have a rental, but I'm the one who has to deal with this paperwork. And I'm sorry, Lisa, just filing it away. I'm going to put your address on the forms because you don't see the stacks of paper for information that we don't use. And again, properties again, that we've be. had in the past, problem properties, they give us information, but it's still, there are still problems. It is not the, the, band-aid that's going to fix everything and i've said this to you multiple times it's about enforcement it's about regular checkups and i can't think of the word inspections that is where you're going to have your greatest authority and ability to address these issues not on a piece of paper How do you and i would say again that as other people said to me the piece of paper and it could be one piece of paper is does have information as an enforcement tool it doesn't need to list everything but i i guess but i can i think i'm done talking about it i'd like to call the question uh and give steve some guidance as to what he needs to produce um and sarah you mentioned um the things we kind of have consensus on i mean it sounds to me like we want to make the landlord responsible we don't want to get in between the landlord and the tenant that's one thing steve that we can we can deal with on this on the form and number two is we will ask for that information. They must provide that information should we ask them for that. On request, yeah. And, and three, uh, we can say that all landlords should familiarize themselves with the ordinances on noise and, and uh, you know, the various, various ordinances that we're trying to uh, control the, the mm -hmm. tenant. And a box that, the check box that says, I understand that I am responsible for the, or whatever, I, I understand that I'm responsible to read the ordinances on the website or wherever. Absolutely, it is. absolutely. I have read and hereby agree to terms set right. forth, blah, blah, blah. Do you feel you, I mean, how does everybody feel about that? We keep the, uh, keep the parking as it is. We keep the uh, uh, boarding house rule as it is, but those other things we simplify. How do you guys feel about that? The other things are uh, requirements to rental housing permit applications. I'm just looking with respect to several things. Steve, what are the other things? Yeah, so 
I'm sorry these things kind of spin on each other, but maybe we'll try to take it up that way. So the license plate information, does that do anybody any good? We, you know, because that's it, something that can come off the form, even if we keep the prohibition on commercial parking. Yes. Oh, I shouldn't say. <laughs> well, so what I, the way I was looking at it, you, I don't expect the police to go around and check license plates, but when there's a problem, like there is right now, maybe having that information would be helpful. I don't know. Maybe Troy would say, no, I don't know. So right, is us or, is or maybe us? our rental housing inspector would use it for something. I don't, I don't know. The names, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Chris, you were, you were saying that that license plate information has been used in a couple of years? To the best of my knowledge, the license plate information has not been utilized. Uh, it's more the number of tenants in a property. Um, in two years, I believe I counted it up. It was five times I was asked for information. Of any, of any tenants? Of the rental, of all the rental forms in a two year period of time, it was five times I was asked for information. And what information that was? Who was it was like, tenants, number of tenants. Number of tenants. And, here's the thing, and that's what, what I remember. I, I have been known to be wrong, but going through my notes, it was who's living there, how many people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Say, what if they don't drive? What if they walk or they got a moped? I mean, we're, I thought we're, the, the focus is the, the people inside the building, not the vehicles out front. So to me, the license plate seems kind of a moot point. You know, or they could ride with somebody. I mean, I don't know what the license plate would tell you. But it relates to the commercial parking, I think, Doug. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it relates it's not to perfect. the right i could let this go it's just like we have a place in town right now that people are complaining about what is the license plate of the cars they're complaining about does that serve any good purpose i don't know i guess troy that's troy kelsey does that by us by us collecting the license plate information does that help you at all in those situations I don't know what we're going to do with enforcement. If there's violations such as, and I'm not sure which one Lisa is talking about, unless it's the one that I've been responding to, in which case there are parking violations that have been enforced and will continue to be enforced regardless of whether we have license plates on file. As far as what license plates are associated with a particular property, uh, if they have a guest, I mean, it doesn't matter what car is legally parked in the driveway if it has if the license plate is registered or somehow associated with that property or if it's a family member or a guest or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or just a friend that they're letting even park without charging them but park there because they live close to the hospital and walking there. If you're talking about parking violations, whether it's parking across the sidewalk or parking in the street or parking in, you know, co contrary to the time restrictions, those are enforced regardless of whether there's there's a license plate on file that's associated. I think that Lisa's point that maybe it would be useful information to Brian, if there was, if there was a chronic offender that police were doing enforcement action, you know, let's say it is the overnight parking or whatever, and that is just one more piece of uh, being a bad neighbor, what, but one more repetitive violation that's associated with an already problem property, then perhaps that can be used to case build for action against that property. But that's more over to Brian and Steve. As far as enforcement of parking violations, I don't care whether I have a plate. I don't care whether I know that's associated with it. Really having the plate associated with the property most helps. Mm -hmm. And I want to contact the owner of that vehicle to say, you know what, uh, your car was just the victim of a hit and run and you've got Potawatomi economy plates, but I ran you across the, you know, our, our rental spreadsheet and I see that you actually live at this address on Highland, so I know where to go to contact them. But from an enforcement point of view, it does me a little good, but it may assist Brian. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can uh, get a show of hands of who would like to keep, like you know, just to see if we have a majority or what. Who would like to keep the license plate uh, listed on the rental permit? Who would 
you know, yes, they would. Or uh, who would who would like to keep it? I just want a show of hands. I would say I would. And Troy's right. It's not for the police. It's for the rental inspector. Okay, so the majority don't want to keep it on. So let's go to the next thing. Uh, and what was that, Steve? Uh, so, so the next one I have is like deleting the references to other ordinances. I, I think I heard that pretty loud and clear that we'll, we'll have them sign something saying I'm bound by the ordinances, but we're not going to call out disorderly house and public intox and stuff. And, they, and the ordinance may change periodically and they're responsible to keep informed. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? Good, Bobby. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to give them any, any outs whatsoever. I'm just I no, know. I know. Well, and that, you know, from, I always mildly at least object to having people sign things that say, I know that their I ordinances know. and I'll I abide know. by them, because that's just another way of saying I'll follow the law. Well, you don't get an out if you don't sign it. Anyway, okay. Right. The next one, tenant signatures. You know, again, the idea was to put some of this information in front of the tenant, make sure they saw it. At least you'd have the form and say, hey, you signed this. I, I think it's probably an unusual circumstance. I think Lori could speak to that as, as well as, as uh, Brian and maybe others, but, uh, but I think it's pretty unusual on a rental permit that you have a tenant sign off on it. Um, so does anybody want to keep that? No, yeah. not me. Show, show of hands who want to keep that. I don't see any hands. <laughs> okay, so then, so that's the easy stuff. So then back to, as I understand it, everybody's in favor of keeping the prohibition, the, the rule against rental uh, rooming houses. And, and, the, and the debate was whether we change the form to say you'll give us that information if we ask for it or we keep the form yes. to say no you have to give it to us and I, I don't think I got a consensus on that so maybe Louise you could direct a show of hands on that. Okay uh, a consensus of uh, what Steve said about asking the landlord for the information rather than putting it on the form. Who's in favor of that of the five? Asking. Who's in favor of, cha of changing the form? Well, it changes the form. So that right. changing the form to say that the landlord will provide that information if asked. On request, right? right. Okay. And those in favor of that, raise your hands. Is that what you want? Yeah. Hey. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. Um, so, Steve, can we just simply have, like Iowa City does right now, just a disclosure form on our website for the landlords? to have available and it's just their responsibility. Yeah. You bet. Because like I've been talking with Lori, Chris, you know, Terry about, it's just still their responsibility. The disclosure forms there if we need it, they provide it to us. If they don't provide it to us, then we can go, you know, an infraction route. Yep. Okay. And the okay. point is to put it on the website so we have workflow. And the, there will be logic. So if you answer this way, then another box will pop open. Um, so having having this all sorted out and on the website is where we are trying to go to. Great. That'd be the whole rental form would eventually be on the website. That would be my hope because right now they can pay online, and so I would like to marry the two together. <clears throat> Excuse mm -hmm. me. And so it is a simple process, but those forms on the website have to be built from scratch. And that is why I have been nagging, and I freely admit I am, to get this taken care of, because that takes time. Yeah, that seems so still, like a back on some of the administrative work as well, right? Like for me, Chris, because you must take that paper form and put it into the spreadsheet, right? It would, it would cut back on some of the administrative work. I'm Correct. It would simplify the, the whole process. There wouldn't be printing, mailing out. You would save on postage and, and printing costs. My time, of course, things would be uh, in our stored in our website. So it would be accessible for whomever, uh, which would be especially beneficial for Terry and Brian as they're going out to look at things. Because uh, we're trying to also marry the rental permits and the building permits for each property. So 
it all builds on each other, but it truly starts with what the council wants and what is truly needed on the form and what isn't. I see. Okay. So then well, I think you I'm- You can get that done by the day. Um, <laughs> well, you throw in a surgery on July 30th and it's gonna be close. That's why I'm asking. I mean, you know. So we're, it's like two years ago and I appreciate what you're doing, Louise, I really do. <laughs> Steve, you wanted to say something. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I think I'm. I think I'm down to two issues. Then, that, so uh, with respect to rooming house, uh, as I've said a few times, right now, and the, the consensus is to keep this, as I understand it. You can't have a. You cannot have a rooming house in the R1 zone or in Burkdale. Okay? okay. There was some mention of like, well, maybe we should just ban them everywhere. And, and, and as I said, and I didn't really let Brian answer, but I, like, I think that the policy judgment of the council at the time was, no, if you've got the square footage in, in, the, in the new building at, uh, at Grandview, you could, have, you, know, you could have two people in each, in each of two bedrooms, which gives you four, and they can all be undergrads, and, and that's okay. But I, I asked Brian, because it's like, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe you can't have four people in Grandview anyway. Um, but if you can, does the council want to say you can't have a rooming house in Grandview? Because that's not what it says now. Brian, uh, can you comment on Grandview at all? Muted, Brian. Oh, Brian's muted. Hey, Brian, you're still, there you go. Yeah, yeah, forgot about that little mute button there. Um, I mean, I, th I think Grandview, we're going to have other issues as far as parking and stuff, you know, over there as well. So, I mean, I really think the 35% of the bedrooms there, 100, you know, 100 square feet parking and stuff like that is probably going to eliminate things over there on its own as far as from, you know, from the rooming house kind of thing. Okay. All right, so we, so I won't change the ordinance to say that rooming house prohibition, ex, you know, extends to Grandview. It'll just be in the R1 in Burkdale like it is now. Yeah, there's, like I said, there's other factors that are going to kind of eliminate right. that over there as well. Okay. Okay. So then the last one then that I have, um, I, I've already got direction that we're going to delete the license plate information from the form. But then the question, do you, are we keeping the prohibition on commercial parking? I, I heard yes. Yes. Yeah, you want to want to show of hands, Louise? Yeah. Yes, if you want to keep the uh, commercial parking as is. As I, is. Yeah. Meaning it's prohibited. It's prohibited. We Prohibit don't have commercial parking. Okay, okay, so everybody raised their hand. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll change the ordinance and I'll send it out, you know, like fairly soon so you can look at it and then whenever you meet again, you can, you can vote on it for the first time. Um, I guess my suggestion would be maybe you just withdraw the current motion and if you're not really in a spot to vote on it. Yeah. I'll be happy to withdraw my motion. I didn't really understand Bobby, that. I didn't either. And Bobby, you uh, re withdraw your second. I do. And it's okay with the rest of the council that this is withdrawn. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Bananas. <laughs> and, and and I'd be in favor of collapsing that so that uh, Chris can do his job. That makes sense. You mean don't don't well, wait three readings the next time when we get when he gets it done. Yeah, be able to vote on it for the next time around. You got enough, right, Steve? We're good. I do. We're going to move yep. on. You're going to draft right. the perfect ordinance. Okay, last so <laughs> we have consideration of resolution 2015 approving the application of Verizon Wireless to install small communication technology equipment. And uh, so, is there a motion? Mm. You want to discuss it first? Okay, Steve, why don't you go through a little bit, or Josiah, maybe it's Josiah. Sure. Or, 
do you, I, Josiah's on, he's now off, off mute. Okay, right. Josiah, we're at Verizon. Thanks, how do I sound? Good. Great. Good, all right. Um, so this has obviously been talked about for a while. The Zoning Commission held our uh, follow-up meeting last week. Um, if you recall, they met a few months ago. We had a couple pages of review questions and uh, Verizon followed up with answers to those. Um, as I noted in my uh, monthly report, after we got those answers back, uh, we didn't find anything uh, that we couldn't work with or that um, we felt we couldn't support. So um, we recommend approval. And I think the biggest thing was there are some items with Mid-American that we can work with um, on getting power to some of those poles and, and figure that out with direct with Mid-American because that's their, their work anyway. And you need so, a motion, Louise? Well, yeah, but I just wanted Steve to comment on what the Zoning Commission recommended. Yep, so the, the commission met uh, a couple of times on this issue. Um, we received feedback from uh, Verizon, just like Josiah uh, said. Uh, the commission uh, issued a report that I circulated to the council that recommended at the commission meeting and consideration as part of the city's ordinance 215. The commission issued a recommendation that the council approve the Verizon application subject to the request that Verizon try, they call these things cantennas. Um, anyway, it's, it's, yeah, that they try to keep these up on the poles as high as possible. And that's part of ordinance 2015. Okay, so is there a motion? I'll make the motion. Motion by Lisa, is there a second? I'll second it. Second by Doug. Okay, this is, uh, any further discussion? Okay, roll call vote. O'Sullivan? Aye. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. Swales? Aye. Cook? Aye. Carried? For Casey? Casey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to go to the last uh, item is consideration of resolution 2016. And this is something that uh, we need to get done. Steve, you want to, you put it in your report. I did. Uh, I just had made a note of it uh, so that there's nothing um, all this is a funds transfer and, and Steve Cool could explain it better than me but uh, the council has already voted to you know incur certain indebtedness and um, pay the, the debt pay the interest twice a year December June make a principal payment once a year June mm -hmm. um, so it's not like the question before you is should we build this road and pay for it the question before you is, oh, since we built the road and we borrowed the money, we, we need to allocate money from the general fund to the debt service fund so that our books look right. That's a, that's a lawyer's phrase. Okay, is uh, there a motion? I'll make the motion. Motion by Lisa is second. I'll second. Second by Bobby, and this is... Uh, Consideration of Resolution 2016. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, roll call vote. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. Swales? Aye. Cook? Aye. O'Sullivan? Aye. Carried? Okay, we'll go to your report, Chris. You circulated a report. Right, and it is 925, so if anyone has questions on what I sent out, I would be happy to chat with them after the meeting or email if you prefer. Okay, any questions for Chris? Um, we'll go on to committee reports and uh, we'll go back to Troy and Sarah with community protection. Um, Are we going to pay the bills? Oh, did I skip the bills? Yeah. Okay, well, we could do it after police, but That's the warrants were sent around by Lori. Yeah. Are there any additions or corrections to the warrants? Uh, is there any objection to paying the bills? Uh, hearing none, the bills will be paid by unanimous consent. Okay, we'll go to Troy. You sent around a report. Sure. Is Just it 
in the sake of brevity, uh, if anybody does have questions, I'll echo what Chris said. Uh, just a couple things I'd like to touch on. We have opened up, uh, resumed normal operations for the most part because of COVID. I'd like to point out that the exception is while you will see a, or should see a resumption in traffic enforcement, or at least traffic stops, the county attorney's office has, has asked that all area law enforcement, to the degree possible, refrain from simple misdemeanor type citations unless there is a public safety need. So we will be addressing traffic violations, but at the request of the county attorney's office and to prevent overload of the court system as it opens back up, uh, we're trying to address them instead of citations. Uh, parking, you guys have touched on parking a lot and I knew that was an issue based on conversations that I had with various council members. I am glad to see that you did what you did with the commercial parking. I, I'm not sure there was a need from that. I think that University Heights has ample parking available on street and you just have to look at Marietta parking for visitors or for residents. Uh, I'll let you look at that suggestion as far as perhaps perhaps an alternative use or a modification of the use on Marietta and that can be discussed at another time with council. Getting down to fingerprints, uh, I would like to adjust and I don't know that this takes a motion to do it, but I'd like council's consent and Steve or someone can tell me if it needs a motion, but I would like to adjust our fee schedule for fingerprinting effective immediately upon council's approval. Uh, we currently charge $10 for fingerprinting of anyone, regardless of their residence, whether they're residents or not. Some of the area agencies restrict it to only residents. Others, and I'll, I cited University of Iowa, you know, they charge $10 for students, faculty, staff. They charge $20 for non-university affiliated people. Uh, we are one of the first, well, actually, we are the first area agency to resume fingerprinting. And in the week, we opened up... Uh, June 1 and began fingerprinting. When I left work today, uh, coming home this evening, uh, since June 1, we had done 24 finger sets of fingerprints uh, for people. None of them were U Heights residents. Again, I, I don't think that the modification I'm asking for is outrageous, and I think that it brings us in line with what other, other area agencies are doing. Any comments or questions about that particular item? Any uh, is Any that account? okay with council to charge twenty dollars to non-residents? That's the yes. only change, right? Yes, is it, it, is. it is the only change, correct? Mm -hmm. So okay. it'd be twenty dollars for non-residents, ten dollars for residents. Correct. We would maintain this current fee structure for residents and would increase it to twenty dollars for non-residents. Uh, I think part of the rationale behind behind that with most agencies is that their community, in this case, University Heights residents, are already paying a property tax and two university heights for non-residents aren't or and are availing themselves of services that are being paid for by residents. That's fair, I think. Consensus. Fine with me. Fine with me, Troy. Okay. And Thank you. I will make that, you I will make that adjustment. And Bobby, you nodding your head and Doug's nodding his head. Very good. That's council consensus. There you go. And then the final thing that I'd like to mention is there was community correspondence that Mayor Fromm forwarded to me about a parking issue. Uh, I did take the liberty to uh, to respond to Mr. Mr. Baxter. He and I have had an exchange of emails, most of which have been copied to you. I believe he and I now understand one another. The only reason that I bring it up is his original correspondence was not addressed to me. And I just, even though I believe that it's resolved, I wanted to make sure that that Mayor Fromm and Council agreed. And if they felt further correspondence was needed, I just, I wanted to make sure you knew what my involvement was and that I'm done. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's all I have. Unless you have questions for me. I have a question for Steve, actually, that you didn't touch on it, but it's in your report, Ordinance 235. And I was looking through my notes from a couple of years ago, Steve, that related to 235. And then in 2018, the council directed you to do some research on a form ordinance to use and working on 235 and at the time you didn't find anything. Can, yeah, that's can true. So yeah, the, so the Ordinance 235 was the uh, anti-racial profiling, it's broader than that, but the Police Community Relations Ordinance and, um, and the council did ask me to uh, look into, um, you know, uh, different ordinances. Uh, we, we talked with the Iowa League of Cities and also a couple of uh, 
lawyers uh, who had done a lot of work with the uh, Iowa and American Civil Liberties Unions. Um, um, I, I'm a member of the Iowa Municipal Attorneys Association, and so I we, we tried to shop that notion or that inquiry around, you know, and uh, there wasn't really a lot out there. My guess is there's a lot more out there right now, and there'll be a lot more out there next week, but um, there wasn't a lot as a go-to. Um, we got some guidance and some good input from a lot of those sources, but uh, but that was a, 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 an ordinance that was really created by the University Heights City Council. If I could comment too, since since Sylvia also brought this up, uh, the University Heights Police Department has, and I, I couldn't tell you exactly when it's been, but it's been months ago, began collecting the data on traffic stops, the demographics for those stops, uh, the same form that the Iowa City Police Department uses, all computerized. Uh, yes, the initial meeting, uh, the CAB, the Citizens Advisory Board had been scheduled about the time that the COVID outbreak began. Uh, that delayed it. Uh, also the ability of some of the people that are selected to the committee are they hold prominent roles or positions or where they work in other essential fields that that Zoom meetings also proved uh, too difficult to coordinate. Uh, we are in the process of reinitiating that and I, I as I put in the report I hope to have the initial meeting scheduled either this month or next month at the most uh, at the latest and Sylvia is exactly right this is a model policy again I pointed out uh, the NAACP continues to hold this up as a model uh, across the state in Des Moines other other communities are contacting us tomorrow I have a telephone conference with members from Urbandale about them moving their ordinance forward, forward which is frankly our ordinance with University of Heights deleted and city of Urbandale put in so it is model work and it is I'm excited and I'm still anxious to move it forward and, and we need to stay in front of this we need not to lose momentum and we'll we'll rebuild it here so Steve would you see any value in looking at that again to see if there's well, something to add to our ordinance or or not yeah um, I'm glad you asked that um, as I said in in today's climate I, I just have a sense there's going to be a tremendous amount of focus uh, on the kinds of issues that are identified and addressed in Ordinance 235. And so I, I have, so my answer is I'll get back to you. I'm taking some steps to try to see what's out there and what comes out there so that we can continue to do just what Troy uh, mentioned, which is stay in the front of it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Troy or Sarah? Okay, we'll go to streets and sidewalks. Um, Josiah, you submitted a report, uh, and uh, was there anything uh, you wanted to say publicly now, or does the council want to ask you questions about your report? Um, yeah, it's a pretty detailed report. Uh, I guess the biggest thing going on right now is Olive Court. They're making good progress. Um, I'd say in the next by the time we meet next month, most of that street work will be done, uh, which is which is exciting. So there's a couple other things on there. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Okay, no questions for Dosiah or jo Doug. We'll oh, go. We'll, just we'll the go. Uh, street Doug. signs that were vandalized are the only thing that I would. Uh, Encouraged, but it sounds like Russ and uh, Josiah are on top of that already. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm glad you brought it up. I did talk to Russ today. He went around and removed the the signs. You know, they didn't spray the speed limit, but the uh, parking, no parking, and some of the transit signs. And mm -hmm. he went to Sherwin Williams. I told him about the brake fluid, but he went to Sherwin Williams and got some graffiti removal and where and and he also used the the brake uh uh cleaner but yeah. he had to be careful because sometimes yeah. it would remove things you didn't want removed and then right. meeting with Josiah on signs that need to be reordered or whatever like that mm -hmm. so uh that was good that he he's uh 
got that done and I told him to get the transit information signs back up as soon as he could. He didn't have any problem with their signs taking paint off. Some of the other parking signs, it took the red no parking off. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yes, he's working on that. The uh, only thing that I suggested, and uh, I suggested this to uh, Sharash at the hospital yesterday too, and they were going to implement this as well, is you could put any, even cooking spray on any of the signs that are along the next marching path that we have. And even cooking spray, something that you can buy anywhere would be, you know, a, a non-caustic, uh, eco-friendly way of uh, making sure paint does not stick to our expensive signs. So, but again, we, we don't know where we're at with the march. Is the march over? Is it not over? Nobody knows. But uh, if we thought it was coming back, I, I would be glad to run around and spray paint at least the signage on the path, you know. <laughs> Are there any questions for Doug? I did want to add that uh, on Sunday, I called Mark uh, Phillips, Mark Phelps, sorry, it's late, the snow guy, and he has a uh, uh, extreme power washer and he has a product and he was the one who power washed the street around Stella and got that off and got some off the sidewalks by Triangle Park and uh, on the trees. And so that was good to get that done. And so we'll see a bill on that. And I want to thank again, uh, I'm, I'm driving around kind of taking an inventory and I see this guy in shorts and a t-shirt and I think scrubbing on the box at the Triangle Park and I think who is that guy? I don't usually see Steve Ballard in shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> I get close and it's Steve Ballard. Oh I'm you know scrubbing and then I turn around and then Josiah's walking over. So we have staff who was just on the job scrubbing away helping and thank you so much Steve and Josiah for helping us out and of course Doug helped me out too. So thanks again for that. Pleasure. Um, and you brought all his own equipment too, of course. Uh, yeah. The other thing is uh, where are we now? Building zoning and sanitation? Yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, very shortly um, Johnson County is doing a solarization project, and I want University Heights people to know about it if they're interested. I'm a little concerned. We've got we've got a lot of trees in University Heights, and trees are highly valuable, and uh, so they're a bit of a uh, concern. But if somebody is interested in solarizing their house, they're starting it up again. I sent that information out to everybody on the council. I'm wondering, Lisa, if you can get that on the website so that interested parties can uh, tap into that information to get the schedule for the next meeting, which uh, escapes me at the moment because my memory is so lousy. It's but uh, it's a good deal, I think, if you're interested in solarization. So I started to skim over that email, and were they trying to uh, post uh, delay putting that out, or is it ready to go out right now because yeah I can put it on the website but. yeah there, I don't think there's any any rush in uh, getting it done uh, but if sometime say in the next in the next week I, I think they want they just don't want it to go out on specific kinds of social media that's the way I read that and I can't say okay. that I read okay. it real closely okay yeah I didn't read it all the way through so okay that that concludes my report <laughs> Casey any questions for Casey uh, in this report, I'm also going to talk about, on Monday, I spoke to Karen Kurt, who uh, worked with our goal setting session, because I'd only heard from one person on Monday, by Monday. And so I asked Karen if, uh, if we could have another option of maybe not having a work session, and how would that work? And so there's two choices. Uh, one is everyone turns in their homework from the first session. She could write a final report and then council we could review on their own and set their own champions on some of the projects that are needed. Or the second option is go ahead and schedule a work session and she will go over the report in person to find champions for the projects without any listed. You know, without, there's some, there's some projects that aren't listed. 
And so uh, yeah. I was looking over now that more people, it looked like the 16th works for the most people. That's next Tuesday after the farmer's market at seven o'clock. So which choice do you want, A or B? B is she comes back on the 16th at seven o'clock. A is uh, she gives us a report and then we, we put our own champion in there, our own champions of the project in there. I kind of like that option because when I looked at it, it, it doesn't seem to me there's a whole lot we need to discuss. It's do it or, no. sorry, I'm going to start quoting Yoda here in a minute. <laughs> I, agree, I agree with Lisa. I, I mean, I, I think she could, Karen could provide a report and we could take it. I think, I think she did a good job of just moving the ball down the court. And I wonder, I mean, unless she feels strongly that there's something else aside from identifying champions and moving forward, I think we can just get the report and go for it. Well, she said with the report, you know, that helps her rank. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. That's part of it. You know, remember that ranking mm -hmm. the goal. So she'd put that in a final report. Same the thing. Or would have like consolidated our rankings and yeah, start. that'd be good to see. The yeah. ones that you know float to the top and because we all ranked them high-ish. So. That would be fine with me. Okay, so I'm hearing the majority say that we'll pick option A, and I'll tell her that I haven't turned in my homework. Okay, I'm a delinquent, and when we finish that, she'll uh, write a final report, and then uh, we can take it from there and start working on the goals and list who we want to uh, lead the, be the lead person or the champion. Okay, very good. So we'll go down to finance. Bobby, you don't have anything this month, do you? Correct. Great. Good report. Uh, Lisa, you sent around a, a report. And does anyone have any questions for Lisa? No, they don't. OK. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> OK, any announcements? Uh, is there any objection to adjournment? Hearing none. Uh, the meeting will be adjourned by unanimous consent. Thanks, everyone. Good work, team. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Blood with the baby.